want to drive faster? Listen in as Kinch Rendell, an SCCA National Trophy winner and multi-time pro solo champion himself, interviews the best autocrossers in the land. He talks fast and drives even faster. And now here's your host, Kinch Rendell. The, the real key to being fast in autocross is you go as fast as you can for as long as you can get away with it, but just make sure you don't overdrive the entry of the corner. This is going to be a fun one. Mike Jr. Johnson is this week's guest. He's won a lot of things. I think he said he has 10 championships between Pro Solo and SEC Nationals. And I'm doing this right after I interviewed him while I'm still full of energy from it. So I don't have every single championship he has, but he did win the driver eminence. He's been a Pro Solo overall winner of the points for the challenge win. He also won the Roger Johnson Spirit of the Sport Award. And the fact that he does Evo School, check him out at evoschool.com, what did he say he was best at? Being a teacher. So he has lots of good information because obviously he's been teaching for a long time as well as he took all the Evo Schools before he actually owned it. So I think you're going to get lots of even different ways that he phrases things, different words he uses. I'm still wondering if I misunderstood when he said unwind the wheel versus the wheel is binding. I'm still not quite sure what we were getting at. I mean, I know what we're getting at there. But his terminology might be different that hopefully some of you will pick it up and think about things differently. Even how he talks about backsiding cones, he he phrases it differently. So hopefully, once again, hearing somebody different will give you a little input. He talked a little bit when I asked him about Rivals versus Rival S, Rival S 1.5. I was thinking a spring difference might be something to try there. He said maybe shock settings more. We cover some of the mental game, a lot about walking the course. He covers... The Baja 1000, way later on in the interview, and how that is the most favorite thing he can imagine doing. And from what he's talking about, how everything changes and how autocrossing can help you be a good driver at the Baja, the one rallycross school I did, same type thing. Things change so much that looking ahead is key. And the way he looks ahead, I like how he talks about even slaloms and such. So there's just a lot to this. We've got over two hours of great content here. So let us know what you think about it. If you see him, say hi. Say, hey, thanks for that. As he said, he's very laid back. He answers questions. He obviously has schools you can take, classes you can take. Seat time is key. So if you get a chance, definitely go to evoschool.com. Check out what you can do and sign up. As well as maybe you want to sponsor, not so much sponsor, but get together. Get him to come out for teen driving to really help the kids learn how to drive in their own cars if possible at the limit, what happens and such, just to make everybody safer. So once again, check us out on Facebook.com for this post for his, and let us know what you think. Mike, welcome to the show. Hey, how you doing, buddy? Hey, great. Thanks for the time. I'm glad I finally got you on here. I've been thinking about it for way longer than when I asked you. (laughs) No problem. It's sometimes hard to catch me. I'm traveling quite a bit. Yeah, no, thanks. And where are you at right now? Actually, I am home until, uh, so it's Monday, I'll be home until uh, O-Dark 30 Wednesday morning, and then I'm off to Jefferson City, Missouri with uh, BF Goodrich Tires. We're going to be doing the Shelby Fest, and uh, then I'll, that'll be Thursday, and then Friday morning I'll get up again at like O-Dark 30 and head to Blytheville to run the Pro Solo down in Blytheville, so... Uh, just got back last night or yesterday morning from Daytona with BF Goodrich as well doing Jeep Fest, or uh, in deep, what they call it, Jeep Beach, and uh, that was a lot of fun as well. So we get a lot of traveling involved, but a whole lot of fun with anything with tires. Yeah, exactly. You're you're in something on tires generally. It sounds like. And yeah, once that's that's the way it is. So, Mike, when did this all get started with autocross for you? Well, I started autocrossing like in 1987. And uh, I was kind of fresh out of, I was still in school, actually, but I, I love cars. My dad took me to the racetrack going to watch NASCAR races when I was probably seven years old. So at 10 years that at that point of just loving watching cars and uh, bought myself a Honda CRX and bag groceries, believe it or not. And uh, this guy would come in, he had this really cool Honda Prelude, it was all blacked out and so I uh, started talking to him. Every time I got a chance, I see that guy come in. I mean, I'm taking this guy's groceries out, you know, and we talk cars. And uh, he used to race uh, Formula Fords with SCCA years ago. And um, he took me to my first autocross, told me if I like racing, I ought to go try it. And then autocross was a great way to get in. And that was kind of all she wrote. I ended up getting rid of that CRX and got a, got a uh, 88 CRX SI. 
and really after, I don't know, maybe seven, eight, ten months of getting my butt kicked locally, uh, I won my first event, and, you know, again, it was all just local stuff, but I won my first one, and I went on, like, three years of not losing locally, and uh, honestly, I got bored. You know, I was young. I was I was 17 to 20 years old in that time frame and got bored, didn't know what national level solo was, and decided it would be a good idea to sell my car and get a boat, of all things, and uh, that... That was not cheaper, by the way. Well, of course, I didn't realize that until quite a few years later. But that's kind of all how it started. Just, just love of cars as a kid for my father, and then, you know, meeting this guy that that knew a little bit about sports cars. Because first, you know, as much as I loved NASCAR race with my dad, I thought it was cool. Going around in circles, you know, just kind of looked boring to me in a way to do. And uh, my dad sure wasn't going to write a check to do it. So uh, I found a way I could go do something on my own and. You know, I've always kind of been independent, so I wanted to do my own thing. I love it. I, I had it written down a question like, have you ever been in front-wheel drive? And you just answered that. You started there. So do you remember, yeah, started. like, when you were first there, how many runs were you getting? How much practice did you get? And since you you do coaching and teaching with Evo School, do you remember how you caught on so quickly locally? Like, some people learn by watching, riding. What were you doing back then? Uh, you know, you really didn't get a lot of runs. I want to say maybe we got four or five runs at an event. And uh, it was so we would actually go uh, to this two different sites sometimes a day. So, you know, I'm in Richmond, Virginia. I grew up in Richmond, Virginia as well. And what we would do is sometimes we'd race in the morning in Richmond and then we'd jump in our car and leave and go down to Virginia Beach and run in the afternoon down there. Uh, a friend of mine who's passed away is a, a, a great friend who also... Uh, his his nephew uh, went to school with me, so he had a CRX as well. He'd go with us, this guy named Troy Jones. And we, we really spent a lot of time just, you know, trying to find places to go around. So so seat time wasn't a lot. And, you know, I just learned by watching. Cause back then, nobody, you know, nowadays everybody will, hey, you know, can I take a fun run in your car and stuff like that. I don't, I don't remember a lot of that as a kid, people sharing cars and, you know, letting other people try their cars. I remember one guy let me drive a a, a Celine Mustang. This guy named Mark Lamaskin is a great guy, and uh, I'd never driven a high horsepower rear wheel drive car. And you know, I drove one of those locally. I would say that was around 1990, and I should have known that moment that you know rear wheel drive was what I was my real love because I remember being sideways the whole run almost. It seemed like, and he's riding with me, and he's got this death grip on the on the uh on the dashboard and the seat and you know but we're just enough y'all in it that it was really fun and it was controlled but you know he was like you know oh my god what are you doing in my car i'm sure he was thinking that Mm -hmm. Uh, but i as soon as i got done with that run i knew that rear wheel drive was way more fun but all i knew were honda so that's kind of kind of where i ended up so so how long were you still in a honda after that experience or in a front wheel drive car well, so I ran 87 to 91 locally in, in two different CRXs, and then I got the boat and bailed on everything and, and bought a Jeep and a four-wheel drive and, and just really went to the river almost every weekend. And in 1998, I had uh, broken my ankle. Uh, not actually not broken it, but pulled all the muscles and ligaments in my ankle a couple of times, and I had to get my ankle rebuilt. And so they told me I was going to be you know, out of commission for like three months. So I ended up literally having the quick, I built houses for 25 years. And uh, so that was in the middle of me building houses. And they were like, look, you're going to have to get a job. You can't stand on. So a buddy of mine got me a job uh, working for a magazine of all things, putting stuff on eBay and things like that. And, and they were collectors. It was a collecting magazine. Ironically, uh, my wife Candy worked there at the time. So it was kind of funny. Um, so I, uh, at that point, just uh, grabbed a sports car magazine. I just needed a bunch of car magazines, you know, or something to get me through the time I was going to be stuck on a couch. I grabbed a sports car, which happened to be the 98 Nationals edition, where Mark and Wendy Allen had just uh, both won national championships and kind of did a sweep that year, and they were on the cover, and Allen Stratton's uh, little eclipse. And I read that, and I'm looking through the results, and I'm like, man, I, I remember this guy. I used to run with this guy. Well, hell, I used to beat this guy. And he's going to nationals, and he's 
this guy's like top five in trophies. And you know, I saw a couple of people that I grew up with, a guy named Richard West, Terry Baker. Um, those are two that, that really stick out. I remember it, and I was like, man, if these guys can do national level events and get this kind of coverage, maybe I could do that. So, you know, while I'm sitting there all gimped up, and trying to heal from this ankle rebuild, you know, I got the bug again. So as soon as uh, I healed up, I had a truck at the time, and I, I sold my truck and bought a, a Honda Civic Si, a 99 Civic Si, which at the time I thought was a badass car. And uh, I ran my first pro solo that next May, and uh, I won. So from that, I got what they had then back there uh the grassroots motorsports rookie of the event, so I won that. And uh, and so the, the irony is, uh, I, I then you know uh, met a whole new group of friends that were that I end up some being uh, you know still great friends of the day. Hell, I met Sam Strano at that time, and Pat Salerno, and uh, Bruce Bell, and all these guys that you know whether they work for me or just great friends, you know. Um, so it's just it's been an awesome experience ever since. So my first championship was technically in a, a '99 Civic Si. <laughs> so yes, I do drive front wheel drive. <laughs> hey, you and you, and since you still do all the coaching, you probably still can run, drive front wheel drive. Uh, you know what? I I it's funny. I'm not a huge fan of it, but I, I just when I did the super shootouts about five years ago, which which are now the match tours. Um, I built that program. I would go out on Fridays and I'd try to drive one of each type of car, you know, at the limit to then videotape to allow, so since people and obviously in autocross don't get to necessarily drive the course or see the course at speed until the event has started, my idea was like, well, if I could just go do videos, since I'm not going to run the event, I'm just going to kind of oversee them, be the Howard Duncan, if you will, of the event. But if I drove the course to get it right and I videotaped it, it would allow people to see it better. So I'd do that, and I would drive front-wheel drive there and, and kind of in anger, if you will. And I drove drove Jinx Jordan's car at a couple of those. And let me tell you what, I, I, while I'm not necessarily a huge fan of, of front-wheel drive cars, Jinx's car is completely badass, and I would absolutely run that car if it was on uh, a different tire, we'll say. I would definitely be interested in that. So, and I just bought my kid, my stepson Trey. I just bought him a 2008 Civic Si, and he'll be running uh, pro solos this year in that. So you know, never know. If something happens to my car, maybe I'll end up in one. Nice. And did you say you drove a '99 Civic Si or an '89 '89 Civic Si? Nine, a, a, a '99 Civic Si. Oh, so. okay. Uh, you, that's what you said. I was like, wait, maybe he meant 89. Everybody drives 89s. No, no, 99. And it's funny, the first time Pat Salerno ever drove the car, we were at English Town, New Jersey, he drove it, and it was at the end of the event, we were all doing fun runs. And he jumped in and takes it, and then I'm driving something else. And I look over, and there's my car sitting there with the door wide open, and Pat's like walking away, shaking his head, and he just keeps walking. So I went over and asked him, I said, well, you know, what, what's going on here? And he goes, I don't know how you want anything in that car. He said, Thank, that thing is horrible. And, you know, I, it's all I knew, really. So I kind of laughed because, you know, it it, it did. And, and in hindsight, it was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. But um, maybe that's why I make a good instructor, because I can get into a car and I immediately recognize what it doesn't do right, and I can drive around the problem. Uh, there's goods and bads to that, you know. I mean, doesn't mean your car is always the greatest driving car, uh, but you just know, have to know how to make it work. Maybe it's good if you're driving co-drivers. Maybe that's why I had a lot of success with co-drivers, is I could drive around problems and they couldn't. I don't ah, know. so maybe it's knowing what the problem is and avoid doing that again is a way to phrase that. If the car pushes, then you do anything to keep it from pushing. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. If it's pushing, maybe you just got to slow down even earlier. But that car was just a bizarre car, and, and I didn't know any better. You know, literally, I had an autocross in about, uh, you know, eight, nine years, and that's the car I picked up to go autocrossing in again. And uh, and so I just made it work. The, the funny part is they ran against the Neons back then, and if you've ever driven a Neon, they are the, one of the better handling front-wheel drive cars that there were. Um but you know, I didn't. I didn't seem to have a problem against them. Now I did when I went to nationals that first year in that car. I won the pro solo championship. But 
Also, a car that was in the class that year, another front-wheel drive car that was was really good, was the old Toyota Celicas. And um, I can't remember exactly who won. I know Per Schroeder was running one. There was a bunch of guys. Larry Fine was driving one. I want to say maybe Larry finished second. But they were running 245s on a Toyota Celica. And they looked four-wheel drive. I remember the first time seeing one, I kind of laughed. Like, what are they going to do with that, you know? Because it was so tall. But, my God, they were fast. They were really fast. So, um, I mean, maybe you know, in autocross, it isn't always about what looks right or it's what works right. And those guys sure got it done against me. But they didn't do well in the pros. And I don't know if it's just like a lot of them didn't show up or um, or what. But they, they weren't great pro cars. But, but damn if they weren't fast on, the, on a regular solo course. <laughs> Need to know. I, I want to now look those up because I can't even picture which one that is. So tell us. Oh man, it's it's the it's the Celica that had looked like bug eyes on the front of it. It was that generation. Some of them came in hatchbacks, and some of them came with trunks. But um, man, it was it was, uh, it was amazing how funny looking they were with the two forty five tire on it. But like I said, they got the job done. Yeah, that much grip. So going from front wheel drive to rear wheel drive, what can you tell us about your experience? Would you recommend it? Did it did it slow you down in your progression, or did you learn a few things? I'm hoping you learned a few things that were helpful for rear-wheel drive? Well, my first real-time driving rear-wheel drive at any national level, my, my uh, girlfriend at the time had a, a 95 Z28, and Salerno had just won a championship in that in 99. So at the end of 99, I drove that at an event, and we were up in Fairfield County, Connecticut. Mark Daddio was there. Salerno was there. And uh, during fun runs, uh, Daddy had just jumped in the car, and Pat got in the car, and I was like a tenth off of both of them in my first time driving the car or something like that. I mean, it was close, you know. And I looked, I was like, my God. And what I loved about it is immediately it drove exactly like a car should drive, in my opinion, you know. It, uh, you didn't have to put a lot of steering input into the wheel to get the car to turn. And it was this neat thing as it had a steering wheel and a steering pedal. So if you gave it more gas, you could turn the back end more if you... You know, it was amazing. It drove every in every way like a car should drive to me, more like a go-kart as opposed to a front-wheel drive. It, it just doesn't, you know, the only way you get a front-wheel drive to turn is you turn in the corner kind of aggressively and then lift aggressively so it rotates, and when you're ready to go again, you jump on the gas. It's just a different approach uh, to driving. I mean, in the end, they all really do drive very similar, and, you know, as far as slow and fast out is, is usually the better way but if you have to make the car turn it it was harder to make a front wheel drive you had to be really aggressive to make front wheel drive turn on a dime uh where the, the rear wheel drive cars just they just do what they they're supposed to and and let's face it who doesn't like a lot of horsepower i mean they're fast <laughs> they really move some of us are just scared of it i can admit we're just scared to go that route so so if it's your first I think time that you just need to do it more yeah <laughs> you got to do it more that's the key <laughs> To get used to not flooring it everywhere, like, let me come out of this turn and floor it. But your first event in one, you were close to those guys. That means you didn't have any lag, nothing from front wheel drive really slowed you down. You just knew what to do right away. You or you must have your right foot must have been so good at, hey, look, it's rotating. You recognized right, right away what you could do with it, I guess. Yeah, I mean, to me, it was natural. I mean, I, I started driving at seven years old. So. Uh, and my dad had a, a used car lot with his with some buddies, and they had this this old man next to us had a couple of hundred acres and trails and big open like, field type area, and we'd ride motorcycles. And my dad and his buddies gave us a, a Chevy Scottsdale pickup truck. And my the like, kind of best friend as a kid, he liked to ride motorcycles, so I ended up driving the pickup truck all the time, and and he ride the motorcycle and. So, I mean, you had a really, you know, for back then, kind of a, a you know fast pickup truck uh, that had no weight over the back. So, you know, I was used to the thing kind of fishtailing, but it was, there was no course. There was no, it was just us being kids being crazy, you know. We'd run out of gas and have to hike back, and they'd give us a gas can and another car to go fill it up, and they'd just say, bring us the can and the, one of the cars back. And that was kind of the end of it. So, to me, it didn't. I didn't even know really what front wheel drive was until it was my time to get a car. And for some reason, I I liked CRX. I, I really don't even, couldn't even tell you why I liked the CRX. I just thought they were neat and they were small and 
and uh, you know, I just kind of fell in love with the Hondas at a young age. But in the end, I don't, I don't think it would have mattered what it was. I had to driven a tractor hard if that's what I was given. <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay. So that leads into aggression. You were plenty aggressive to begin with. Sounds like. Or over aggressive? Yeah, oh, absolutely! I was I was over aggressive for a long time. I'm sure. I mean, like I remember my first uh, first tour win in the Camaro in Rome, New York, and uh, I mean, I I don't know. Like you, have, it was a runway course, so it was a lot of transitions, and I just got my rhythm, got it right, and you know, I I kind of checked out. Like the the, the Kozlaks were there, and. Uh, Chris Lindbergh, and it was a really, uh, Dean Sapp, I mean, they were all in my class, and so I kind of checked out on everybody, and then Mike just being greedy, he's like, I want more, I think I can go faster, and I remember spinning through the finish, um, kind of like a full 360, and then backed it almost to the timing trailer, over the cable for the, back then, you know, obviously we all used cabled uh timing lights and <laughs> ripped the cable out of the timing. I mean, it was, it was bad. I was, I was, I was definitely over aggressive without question. And you can ask Strano. He doesn't have a problem with uh, telling me how I used to be a hat. But, um, but I mean, you know, I think that's what you learn. The most important thing I've learned as an instructor is that if you have somebody who's over aggressive, he or she is much easier to teach to be a great driver. But if you have someone who's never willing to push it to the limit or even over the limit, then it's really hard to get that person to, to, to go really fast or really fast consistently. Um, or it's going to take them longer to become that great driver because they have to be willing to go over the edge. Because once they go over the edge enough, they'll start to know where the edge is, and then they can fine-tune that spot, you know. Uh, but if you're not willing to ever get it to the edge, or you get to the edge and it freaks you out, then it's really, really tough. So for me, getting to the edge was not a problem. We, we, were, we, were, we were fighting to keep me from over the edge. I, I love hearing what you just said. I wanted to ask, and for new people, I think that's so key. If you never get there, you just said it right. You never know what the experience is, so you can't. Yeah. dial it back if anything you were dial back oh i almost got there i got scared and that's where i tell people yeah. especially in front wheel drive i would spin my cars even four and five years in after i'd won quite a few events i'd still be there spinning my car at pro solos trying to figure oh, yeah. out can i do this can i shift a third gear here w will it stick and especially at a pro solo you, you get enough chances i feel like you can try things like that oh yeah one of the things i noticed early on just watching mark daddio was that if mark hit on an early run if Mark hits a cone early in an early run, so, you know, first, second run out, and he hits, like, the second corner of the course, he hits a cone, we well, would guarantee there's going to be three or four cones going out. Because now he knows this run is done anyway, so he's going to push his comfort zone, he's going to push his aggression level in every corner so that he can see what can you really get away with. And, uh, and I mean, I, I probably do that as well. I don't pay attention to it, but, you know, in watching Mark, it's just one of those guys that, you know, everybody wants to see run and, uh, you, you'll see that a lot. I mean, look, look at Strano this year, last, last past year at nationals. I mean, he, he combed away, you know, everything. And it's like, once you hit one, you're done. You're not, it's not like you're going to win, but, have, so you got to push your limits and see what you can get away with. And, and unfortunately, that will bite you, as Sam knows. And I've, I've come a couple of championships away as well. But the irony to all that is, my, to me, my best finish ever at Nationals was a, a finish that I finished. It was fourth, but I carried a two-second penalty to fourth in Superstock. So um, to finish fourth in Superstock with a two-second penalty – as far as I was concerned, that was like a win, you know, it was a 60 some car field that year. So, um, I mean, being aggressive, you're never going to win if you're not aggressive, but if you're over aggressive, it's going to bite you here and there. And, and, and I'm sure that anyone that's ever really ran towards a pointy end of the stick and solo has coned away championships. I'm sure. I, I wish I could say that. Unfortunately, what I have realized <laughs> hearing from people is if anything on day two, one time I left him like, what happened? I was leading again on day one. And luckily Alex Mearson yeah. said, dude, you weren't driving hard. 
And so yeah. some part of my mental game wasn't like go out there and be aggressive. It was like, hey, I'm in the lead. It's okay. Just get a good run in. So that's a huge note for some of us is we have to keep that same level of aggression all the time. And I love what you pointed out there about if you hit a cone early on. It reminded me the best time I ever drove my Audi S4 in D stock was I hit a cone early on at Coors Field. And I drove like no other after that. And that event, had I not hit that early cone, would have been my first ever local win. And luckily I realized, hey, there was so much more to it when I was that aggressive. So I hope everybody will make note of that, what you're saying, that Mark Daddio and you would do. If you hit our cone early on, okay, don't feel bad for the course workers. See what else you can push out there. What else will every single turn, how aggressive can you be? Yeah. They call them course workers for a reason. I say put them to work. (laughs) Exactly. It's healthy, right? It's healthy. Get them moving a little bit. Get that blood flow going. Exactly. Exactly. So that no, that's that's great advice. That people you should be aggressive, and if you're not being aggressive, you're gonna take longer to get there. Do you have any tips for the people that are not aggressive, or if you're coaching them, what are you what are you challenging them to do? What are you saying to them? Well, I, I think, I mean, for years I tell people that the, the real key to being fast in autocross is you go as fast as you can for as long as you can get away with it, but just make sure you don't overdrive the entry of the corner. Because uh, most people, the, the majority of people that do come through the school, their problem is that they're over aggressive. They want to go fast to go fast, and and the problem is that is they usually do that on the entry of the corner. So we always remember to go slow in and fast out of the corner. You know, you can you you're you're always going to drive less distance. So if you have a corner that's say a, a thirty mile an hour corner, that's the fastest your car could physically go through it. If you go in 28 and I go in 32, you'll beat me out of the corner every single time. Because even though we made the same mistake but on opposite ends of the spectrum, my mistake by going in too fast is I'm going to turn in and the car's going to push, and now I'm waiting for the car. And that's time just going away. And then once it stops to push, I now have to travel a further distance. So physics tells you it takes longer to go a further distance, right? So now you've got one mistake with two huge consequences on the clock. Whereas if you go in two miles an hour too slow, immediately at turn in, you're like, oh, man, I got more. And you can roll throttle so that just for a smidgen of that corner, you weren't max- maximizing your load or maximizing your potential. And then immediately, though, you know, you roll throttle, you get it to that maximum load number that maybe is 30 in this corner. And so for like, you know, three quarters or more of that sweeping corner, you're maxed out. You've got everything you got. And so for that little 25% on the entry that you messed up, it's a small penalty. And that's really the key. Do not overdrive your entries, and, and you'll be golden. I, I like that, especially you explain the physics part of it, which John Ames had taught me way back when. And the fact that you're pushing, yeah. you pushed deep and offline. So now you have that extra distance the wrong direction while you're trying to slow down, and extra distance coming back to the proper line while you're still waiting yeah, to come down to the right even... speed. Right, and that doesn't even come and you know talk about more than likely the people that drove it right have pushed you know some some dirt and debris out into that further distance area. So now you're trying to make grip on something that it's usually marbles, especially at nationals or national level events where there's so many runs going on. Uh, it becomes a third third penalty, if you will, that that you know is just a kind of just a little added piece of the puzzle because you were too aggressive. So and and you know, look, the amount of times that I've made that mistake is is off the charts. And uh, for a long time in pro solos, my I made big mistakes because I get so amped up uh over the lights, you know, over the tree and the launch, uh that I'd usually screw up my first corner because I was so worried about the start that I would forget that, you know, you know, there's a rule, <laughs> don't overdrive your first corner. And I'd be, you know, whether I was pissed because I didn't get a good start or, you know, paid more attention to the guy next to me or something like that, um, you know, and then I'd overdrive my first corner. So now literally one corner into this event I'm or this run, I'm already behind the eight ball because I, I stopped paying attention to my own rules, you know. Oh, exactly. That's but, where I tell people I'm really fast when I keep it very, very simple. So when you explained yeah. – breaking maybe a little bit too much so that your only penalty is the one penalty coming in a turn. Are you telling people to trail break, not trail break, focus on straight line breaking to accomplish that? No, not not at all. I'm just saying don't go barreling into the corner. You know, 
as far as the trail brake, not the trail brake thing, you know, to me, it's more about just getting the car slowed down so that when you make that turn in, you're at the perfect turn in point and you can minimize your distance and maximize your load through the corner. Um, you know, really, the reality of, you know, people ask a lot of times about trail braking at the schools. They are, you know, should I trail brake this corner? And I just look at them and, like, think, do they really even understand what trail braking is? And for me, the best way to explain what trail braking is, you you know, think about your drive on the exit ramp of the highway. Maybe there's one near your house that on occasion you like to drive a little spiritedly and uh, the big clover leaf. And so you're rolling down the highway and you're coming into that corner. And as you slow down a little bit to get into that corner, the trail brake is really that time where your foot just comes off the brake as you gently lay the car into the corner and go back to the throttle. I mean, so, so that is all different in every scenario, you know, when you start. The, the biggest question that's ever asked of me at a school is, where do you break? Or even at an event, where are you breaking? I don't know. I have no idea. You know, because it's all determined by what you did coming into the corner. If you screwed up the previous corner, so you're, you're not going as fast into this, well, then I'm going to break deeper. But if you nailed that last corner, now you're hauling the mail down to this one, well, I'm going to have to break sooner. And where breaking, where breaking is determined and how you're going to win, you're going to trail break, or how much you're, all that's determined by what your eyeballs see. There's nothing really to do with nothing more than your eyeballs and that seat of your pants, you know. So uh, I, I honestly do my very best in schools to stay away from two subjects, trail breaking and apexes. Stay away from the words. They don't, you, because they get too technical. I try to, for the majority of my students, I teach them like they were a house painter, right? I don't want to teach them like the guy's an engineer or the girl's an engineer because they get in so enthralled in the technical side of everything and, you know, this and, you know, trail breaking and, you know, slip angles and that. None of that matters. It's what your eyeballs see and what you can get away with that allows you to be fast. You know, if if you sit there and you worry about all this other stuff, you overthink things, and the next time you make that corner, you're so worried about this. And even if you nail that one part that you were so worried about fixing, you're going to screw up the next one. And so, you know, I, I keep it simple, you know, keep it really simple, and, it, and it's much easier. And most importantly, and this is tops of all, have fun. You know, that's the biggest thing that, that we miss in solo, and I see it happen at every big event. Hell, I see it happen locally. People stop having fun. They take it too serious. The reality is we're, we're playing in parking lots or airport runways, and we're racing around rubber cones. I mean, we're not winning F1 championships. We're not winning the Indy 500. We're going out. We're hanging out with the people that we love and that we're friends with. We're having a good time racing against plastic cones and a clock. So, you know, it's a lot of fun. I mean, mean, there's very few people that make this hobby a job. I'm one of the few, and I don't take it serious. So I don't take – when I say take it serious, I don't take it so serious that it bothers me. Um, I think that's a real important key that all of us should remember is that this is about fun, about hanging out with our buddies that are also car people and uh, and really enjoying it because in the end, you know, we're not here a long time, so we might as well make the best out of it. No kidding. We're at the event for how many hours and we get to race for how many? Right. That's where I think the social part yeah. is. So it's good to meet people, talk to people. Yeah. In the case, if we can point yeah. something out or walk course with them and BS as well as, hey, I'm thinking I'm going to drive over here. It's all fun. Yeah, I think, it go, I, I was going to say, I, I really think it's important to, I mean, don't get me wrong, I want you to take it serious enough that so you do well. But I don't want you to take it so serious that when you get out of the car, you're pissed because you made a mistake. Because honestly, autocrossing is really hard. Really, really hard. I've driven I've driven the Baja 1000 a couple of times. I've done circle track racing. I've done road racing. I've done time trials. And autocross is absolutely one of the hardest things I've ever done in an automobile to do it perfect. I've never first off seen a perfect run. I'm Kozak one year. Uh, unfortunately I was in his class and he, he was at a pro in a Skoda and he was paired up against John Ames in a Z06. Paul was in that IROC and Paul came back and beat John Ames in, in this run. And I, I, when I came back and I saw that, I was like, did that really just happen? Like, so I said to Paul, I was like, man, how in the hell did you do that? 
you know, that was awesome. He's like, I know, that was a pretty good time. But you know what? I left a little bit on the table back, and he points to the corner. I'm like, <laughs> I mean, what I thought was a perfect run, time-wise, was just amazing. And then for him to immediately know there was more time on X corner. You know, I, I asked John about it later. And he's like, I can't even believe he ran that time. He's like, that's just crazy. So um, it's tough. We just, even the best of the best, they don't, there's never a perfect run, you know. Yeah, we, we always think there's something else. That's that's right. It's crazy. You'll win. And I'll do that and be like, oh, no, but I could have done this or that better. That, I'm not sure if, yeah. if the most aggressive people have that thought. I don't know if everybody listening has that thought of, are you like that? Because I think most people – we're so competitive and it's really with ourselves, at least for me, it's with myself of, man, I didn't do that right. I didn't look far enough ahead. I, I, I shouldn't have been there. I should have been there. I wonder how many people think that way versus they get back and they don't remember if they messed up. At times I'm like that. I'm like, whoa, you weren't paying attention. You better figure out what you can improve on the next run. Yeah, no, that's huge. Wait, that's a huge, huge piece of the puzzle. And I, I encourage students to do that. You, there's two things that are important to, to come back, self critique, and take all that information in and think about what you did. But but the most important piece of this is be honest with yourself. When you make a mistake, you have to acknowledge it. If there's nothing worse as an instructor, because I'll do this a lot, and I swear I think students think I'm not paying attention, but I'll look at them after a run and I'll say, so what would you think? I got my opinion. I've watched what happened. But I want to know what they say. I think they think I say it because I wasn't paying attention. But... You know, you ask them, like, so, so what did you think of that run? If they come back to you and you knew there was three or four places that they obviously made a mistake, and they say, man, that one's pretty good. It's like, damn, you know, in my mind, you know, they're not getting it. They're just not getting it. But, you know, you have to be honest with yourself. Be able to go back and close your eyes, drive that course, think about the run you just took and where you were and were you really where you wanted to be or could you do it better. Um, and those are important pieces to making yourself better as a driver. Um, you know, and if, but if you can't, you know, do that, or if you're not honest with yourself and you don't really critique yourself fully, it makes it harder. You it, ultimately, our whole phase two program is about trying to make you your own instructor. I mean, I, I'm a product of the school. Like me, physically, I took the schools uh, back in 2000 when I started driving the Camaro, and the phase two absolutely changed everything about me as a driver because I then knew how to close my eyes and drive that course and and mentally get seat time that I wasn't going to get because we're not like, you know, in any other form of racing where you get practice laps or, hell, even in Baja, you get to take, you go out and you do a pre-run of the, the whole course. I mean, at least you've seen something where in autocars, you get nothing. You can walk it. But other than that, you're done. So, so you got to really concentrate and, and close your eyes and think about what you did, make mental notes, and what, at a bare minimum on the next run, don't make that same mistake. You know? Exactly. I like I like to keep that symbol, too, of try to fix one or two things and do everything else the same instead of pushing everywhere. And this tie, the pushing everywhere for me or a hero run ties back to what you said earlier. Be, every Like, where to break? You said it depends on where you came from. What did you just do? Did you screw up or do better in the last turn? For me, it took me so long at Pro Souls to realize I would keep trying to make my breaking zones deeper. And then it dawned on me, hey, goofball, you've done this side three or four or five times. You might be approaching everything slightly faster, so to break a little sooner. Like you said, it's the butt of your pants. It's, it's your butt should be telling yeah. you how fast you're going as, as you, your eyeballs look left or look right. Yeah. I, I think of it as if I'm looking into the, you know, the, I, I like to lurk, look into the middle of the corner, kind of the point where my car would be perpendicular to where I am now. And I look kind of at that point and, or even maybe all the way to the exit of the corner. And I think to myself as I'm looking there, like, oh, my God, how I'm tall in the middle this way. How am I going to get there? going this fast and immediately you'll slow down immediately um and we see this all the time in our phase one because we typically have our phase one set up where it's a slalom first and then we'll dump you into a skid pad and once you start to drive the slalom right the brake zone moves way back because you're carrying an extra five mile an hour or more and you try to brake at the exact same spot you know, and next thing you know, you, instead of being tight around the, the the skid pads, you know, you've got a car length inside of you. And, you know, and while maybe your mile an hour is higher out that far, it's not faster. 
<laughs> you know, so it, it's it's kind of funny to watch that. And, you know, you hear it all the time. Where do I break? Well, I, I break where my eyeballs in my butt say, you know what? You're going too fast, dude. You know, uh-huh. and I just drop the anchor. And that, that's, the question was, you said, how will I get there? How will you, your car get there? And especially I tell myself at that angle, if you look over, at this speed yeah. of what I'm feeling right now, am I going to make it over there or not? Yeah, exactly. It's it's that's you know aside from looking at where you're going and trying to build that arc in your mind, you know, by looking at where you're going and realizing you're going to be going in an opposite direction, you know, that that really should should immediately throw up a red flag that you've got to give it up earlier. And uh, it's funny, you know, road racers have brake markers, you know, and they concentrate on those brake markers. But what, what autocrossers don't understand when they talk about that or anybody who's been a track guy and then comes to autocross and they, they look for that brake mark and, and they don't think about it is, you know, on a track, you usually have had multiple sessions and they, the last I checked, they didn't change the track the last time you came in, you know, next time you go out. Uh, so you can get away a little bit with that brake marker mentality, but that doesn't mean that you should. You should still be looking into the corner and and breaking based off what your eyeballs are seeing and what your you know seat of your pants or your, I call it your butometer, what your butometer is telling you. Once you and that seat become really tight friends, you know you're probably going a little too hot, so you need to blow it down a little earlier. And I'm wondering, not having having done much track time. If you're always looking at those brake markers and then the temperatures change or conditions somehow change, you're probably braking still at that same place without really realizing, hey, I should just be relying on looking ahead. What am I feeling? Absolutely. Absolutely. That is huge. Temperature is huge depending on where you are in a session. You know, so as an example, and, and uh, you know, if you're on certain tires, certain tires are going to be faster on their first two laps. Right? And then they're going to fall off tremendously. But if you only use that same break point mentality, right, you're more apt to go off in a later session or later in the session. So if you've got a tire that goes fast, really fast on its first two laps but falls off dramatically, but you're using the same break point you did on the first two laps, the, the likelihood of you going off is pretty high on that type of stuff. Um, and temperature as well, you know, cold, colder temperatures, colder track temperatures, not enough grip. Um, those things make big differences. So, um, you know, circle track works the same way. You know, some, most of the most track tires, like a circle track tire, actually start off cold and don't have as much bite and get better as you go. Um, but again, those first two laps, if you get used to only braking at certain points, it can make a big difference on on those first couple of laps. Um, and so it's, and it's even in autocross, like you were saying, overdriving the first turn in a rear wheel drive car. And the front-wheel drive car, I'm almost thinking the same thought, but it's because rear tires aren't warm. For the so rear, right, because you're afraid you're going to swap in. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I'm always like, okay, I'm going to let I, a couple pounds out of the rear and hope it sticks and really try to be smooth on that first turn, which is probably smart to do anyway, and be more aggressive later. Yeah, that actually, that kind of leads me into something that I think is huge that, that most people don't even think of when it comes to, to autocrossing or just any kind of performance driving, but... Um, is anticipation. You know, for you, it's a cold tire. It, you know, it's front-wheel drive cars, cold tires. You've anticipated that thing's going to be really loose going into turn one, two, and hopefully as you get deeper in the course, you've got some little more heat in them and you've got more bite. So you're anticipating this is a problem. But that same thing applies to me in, a, a, say, the year when I ran the, the Lotus Elises. It was, it was really, really important to anticipate throttle off Okay, because if I wasn't dead straight and throttle off, that thing wanted to swap ends on me. And then when I get into the Z06s, it's I anticipate when I get on the gas, it's going to be loose. And so by thinking in my mind, I know I'm coming off the corner, I know I'm going to start to unwind, you know, I'll, I'll be more apt to unwind quicker. Uh, and be ready for it, and more, most importantly, squeeze on the gas pedal a little more gently until I've got some heat in the tires, and, and or I've got, you know, I know the car's going to stick. Anticipation is a huge piece of, of, of a great performance driver, is knowing what your car is going to do in any moment, and, and, and know, or at least know what it could do, so that you're mentally prepared for that. I could see you, like as you mentioned, going through the course with your eyes closed, or having memorized Thinking of those things like, oh, yeah, these first two or three turns, and we'll be expecting this to maybe happen, so we'll be a little gentle with the gas pedal or the steering wheel or both. 
Is that something you would do as you sat there and, let's say, pre-planned a run? Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Hell, I can give you a great example. I did a school in Greenville, uh, South Carolina, uh, a few, about a month and a half ago, um, and I had uh, the, the little Volkswagen Rabbit uh, there, um, the FSP car. I'm sure you're familiar with it, the orange one. I can't. My, just had a brain fart here, and I can't remember his name. P- Zimmer. Zimmer. Yeah, yeah. Jeff Zimmer. And, and, I mean, let me tell you. That car, I've watched that car spin enough to know that that car, when it's like cold tires, is loose. Um, and so I'm going out, I'm going to take a run, and I've watched them run twice. The co-drivers were in it, some of the ladies were in there. And I'm riding, and I, the first thing I've got is a slalom right out of the box. So, I, you know, in my mind, I just rode with her, and she spun it out twice. And then, so I get in the car, and in my mind, I'm like, be ready for it. Be ready for it, and uh, you know we're going to the slalom. And I, you know, I just anticipated, and I was I made sure I turned early, but smooth, and stayed ahead of it. I could feel it moving, but I didn't let it sneak up on me because I knew that it was a potential problem, and so I just made sure that I uh, stayed ahead of the problem. So, and the funny part, I had a, a, a guy, one of my best buddies, as far as the pro touring crowd goes. Kyle Tucker, he's a teammate of mine at BFG. He is high horsepower, rear wheel drive, muscle car guy. Never driven a front wheel car drive in anger, and we put him in that. And I told him, I was like, "Be ready for it." And he came back with the biggest smile on his face. He's like, "I felt it wanted to go, but I knew it was coming," you know. And and did a great job. Helped her get faster, uh, but he really loved the car, you know. And it's like. As long as you know and you're ahead of it and you're ready for it, it's it's not a big deal. So anticipation is such an important you know piece of the puzzle. And I kind of helped him on his anticipation because I knew it was going to happen. I knew he hadn't driven a lot of them. He told me the only other than a Camry or something that he had rented uh, at, at your average national or enterprise rental car. He's like, I've never driven a, a front wheel drive car in anger. So I thought that was kind of funny. Nice. And something made me yeah. think there for anticipation. Sometimes, sometimes some people say, Ron Williams, like, you should actually watch other cars. Sometimes I'll actually go work course when I don't have to or watch. Mm -hmm. And really it's so I can see if people are having big mistakes somewhere. And then I'm anticipating, okay, I better either walk the course again there or realize something's not working there. And I've really found that if if somebody else is driving a car like yours, you can anticipate where you're Mm going to have to upshift or downshift as well as where they're having issues because lots of cars are spinning. Would you advise that to people? Do you do that yourself at all? Well, you know, one of the things that I love about the school is we make them work as part of the school. And, you know, some people don't want to work because it's just not fun to work course maybe. But in the end, it's a great learning tool. And by watching that and taking that information in, it, it's really important and, and for exactly those types of things. If you hear a car that's similarly geared to yours and you hear they're going to third, you know now in your mind that this is going to happen. So you're ready for it when it's your turn. Um, so that that's a, a real and important piece of the puzzle. Um, I believe it or not, and this may sound crazy, but I actually, when I took the schools, you know, our phase two, we start to get you to talk talk to yourself and, and talk ahead to think ahead. When I went back out on the course after my session in the phase two, and then we have two more sessions after that, every single car that ran the course while I was working, I talked them through. So literally, I'm like, you know, in my mind, actually, I was doing it out loud, so people were looking at me like I was crazy, but, you know, I'm like, you know, they're looking at this, now they're looking for this, now they're looking for that, now they're being patient, 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 there they are, look for it, there it is, go, go, go. I just talk my way through their course. I was training myself to be my own coach. And so that way, when I went out in later sessions, I, you know, I was doing the same thing. I just drove it into my own mind. So that's huge. And, and I have, uh, at nationals, on occasion, I will go out and work an extra heat, especially if they ask for volunteers. Uh, or sometimes if I see a corner that's struggling, I'll go out there and work that corner so I can watch and learn more about the corner. That's the disadvantage to announcing, actually. Um, I, in fact, I haven't announced the last couple of years, and part of it was because I do schools during nationals, but at the same time, or, or test and tune stuff. But also because I want to be able to watch and, and it really helps me be better. Yeah, I can't tell people enough times that when I first started, I never rode with anybody. Not because in the, what, 
I guess, 2001, 2002, that wasn't a thing. I just didn't do it. But boy, oh boy, did I learn a lot by watching John Ames and David Fouth and all these guys just watching their lines, watching their hands. And when I can't see their hands, I often watch the front wheels to see Mm -hmm. where they're turning, how often. That's something I can still see. And what you were just describing, at Nationals or any event, if you're not working, you can sit in the stands and basically, as you just said, talk yourself through the course as they go through it. And what I find is if the car is the same speed or somewhere, maybe even faster, it'll get your brain ready for that. Like if you go through watching Superstock, in my case, they're going to be a couple seconds faster. So if I can be thinking oh, yeah. my mental game plan, which honestly I don't do this enough anymore, so now I'm going to be like, oh, yes, let's do some more of that, it should seem a little bit slower when I get yeah. in the car. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It definitely slows everything down. In fact, that's the thing that's weird is when you start to get – better or you even no matter your level when you start to know you've got the runs down they actually feel slower and because nothing's sneaking up on you nothing's you know catching you off guard you're prepared for it and by and it's all just mental preparation that's really the key is is mentally being ready for what's there in the head of the car um, all that, and, and like I said, it doesn't matter if you're an autocrosser or you're an off-road racer or a circle chain. It doesn't matter because if you're mentally ahead of the game, nothing's going to sneak up on you. Okay, and that probably ties in well. What do you do for course walks? What are you doing there? What are you thinking? How many? Well, I, I think everybody's different for me. I, I you know, I always tell everybody to take at least one co- concentrated walk. I probably don't do that as much as I should because I, I usually have a lot of people asking me questions through the while I'm walking. They'll see me, hey, Junior, what do you think of this? Or, you know, um, and I'm a pretty easy, easy laid-back guy, and it doesn't bother me. I don't have to have that concentrated walk. My wife, on the other hand, she wants a concentrated walk with me, but she wants it, like, on the third walk she does. But But I don't usually walk more than three or four times anyway. I, I think that if you sit there and you analyze it and overanalyze it, what I do is I like to walk at once just to know where everything is. And then the next couple of times, start to really concentrate on spot on where you want to be on your line. And then just at the end, kind of close your eyes. You know, you don't have to do the you know that funny little dance you see a lot of people do at the end, where they're closing their eyes and they're driving it and they're they're spinning their head. They kind of look funny. I like to make fun of them because it's fun, but uh, that doesn't bother me. That's part of the stuff we tell them, we teach them. But I think it's really important to be able to close your eyes and drive that course in your head. You know, because if a course has two hundred. 250 cones on it. The reality is there's 20 that make a difference. Remember the 20 if it's 20, or maybe it's not 20. Maybe it's less than that. But if you can remember the key cones and and make sure you get the car on those, that's what's important. And, And one thing that's really, really important, it's usually the exit of a corner that is the most important piece of the puzzle because the exit sets you up for what's next. So being spot on on your exit of a sweeper will set you up for the next element, whatever it is. So, you know, if I'm, if I'm a foot or so off on entry, I don't worry about it as long as I can get the car to the perfect point on exit. And that really makes a big difference. Now, when it comes to slaloms, the most important thing is if you have a five-cone slalom, if you give me three and a half of those cones nice and patient and on the back edge of the cone, then I'll let you have from three and a half to the end as aggressive as you want to be. Because if your average you know, slalom is a 60-foot slalom and you stay tight on the back edge of, of those first three, and I say three and a half because once you get past the third one and you're almost to the fourth one, you can start squeezing for the throttle and get through four and five and not have to be spot on on the back to carry a ton of speed out of it. So... Uh, but but really, it's, it's about late apexing, if you want to use that word. I don't like it, but you know, being right on the exit, uh, lined up perfect for the exit, so that you set up your next element. You're, you're pretty good. Usually, that means being on the back edge of it. No, and would you say on those are there places where some type of cars, let's say momentum cars, will add distance as long as they're at the maximum speed coming out of sweepers, or add any distance on the exit to keep their foot in it? No, I don't mean by adding distance at the exit. Like, so if you, 
you know, if you ask your physics teacher what's the fastest way through a slalom, he's going to tell you a straight line, right? So, so what you'll see, and this is just my opinion, this is, there's more than one way to skin a cat, but what I would do on any slalom, in any car I drive, I'd probably approach it a little bit wider than most, like not that straight line effect, but out wide, and then dive harder, turn a little maybe harder to, to get on the back edge of the cone. So thinking that my left, if, if I'm starting on the right side of the first cone of the slalom, my left rear is going to clip the back of the base. On, and it's, but as soon as the nose of the car gets to that, that line, you know, between the, the one, cone one and two, as soon as the nose of the car gets there, I start to turn. But that left rear tire is going to kind of catch the base. You actually kind of swing out wider, more like a snake would do. You know, like a snake when he goes through something, they they kind of slither out a little wide and then arc a little hard, and then you know. So the first three cones of a slalom, I'd kind of be more arced out wide. But as I get to about cone three and a half, I'm just going to squeeze hard for the loud pedal and use as much of the distance between cone four and five as I can. I want to almost hit four, and I want to almost hit five just to carry speed, right? And, and you're probably going to almost Where, hit those with the front of the car. No longer back, backsiding is correct. going out of your mind. You don't care. Yeah, because you don't need to. But it, because listen, if your average cone, if your average slalom is 60 feet, the average car is 15 feet long nowadays, right? So you're only 25% of the distance. So if you go the straight effect like the physics teacher would tell you, then you're going to actually have to pass the first cone before you can tuck behind it. So you're going to actually probably be close to 30% of the distance. But when you get to cone two, right, you're probably going to be closer to 40% of the distance because momentum and inertia is taking you further and deeper, right? And it's really hard to turn to get behind that because you were so flat, so straight, right? So, and then when you get to the third cone, that, that number even becomes more like 50% or more, and you're actually probably going to have to get out of the gas to tuck behind, you know, cone number three to set up four and five. But if you stay out a little wider with a little more angle, it's going to feel slower maybe mile an hour wise, but it'll allow you to tuck in and then you can, it easily will, will dance through the first three. And when you get to turn three and a half, you'll just squeeze hard on the pedal and drive out of that slalom pretty aggressively. You know, keep in mind, it depends on what the element is after that. If the element doesn't set you up to do that, you might not be able to get away with getting hard on the throttle to get out. Right? So, yeah, true. But, it's not a fast But section. more than likely, more than likely, you'll come out of that slalom with a good amount of speed and set up to do whatever's next, and, unless the course you know designer doesn't allow for that. No, and I, I tell people so often the same stuff in different words, and I think this can be related back to as you were saying, don't push on the entry to a turn or to a sweeper. I would yeah. say don't push at cone three, four, or five in a slalom, especially if you want to accelerate no, out never. of there. That's such. I mean, well, I don't know how much time you're wasting, but on sweepers, I think you waste two tenths to five, half a second. In a slalom, you're probably wasting well, more time. Don't, I would absolutely say don't don't push cone one, two, or three in the slalom. Okay, I meant cone push four out. And five. Yes, yes. Be patient. Yeah, so yeah. think patience, patience, patience. Cones yeah. one, two, three. If people exactly. are noticing, they it's push. just like everything else. Yeah. Or what's another word? Instead of saying push, um, scrub off speed. If you're if you're lifting and having to yeah. scrub off speed in the middle to back half of the slalom that you want to accelerate out of, you've probably wasted over half a second. Oh yeah, yeah. Every time you, have to, every time that nose is shoving, it's not a not a not a good feeling. <laughs> not a good so. feeling, and not a good time when you come back and look at the clock. So you were mentioning yeah. hitting your spots in the Exodus sweepers. Are there places yeah. where you're going to keep your foot in the throttle more, even if it takes you a little extra distance because you can make it back up, you can get back over later. That that's kind of where I was wondering. Like in the Civics, uh, I feel like I started doing that. Uh, Every it is you know every element is or every course is different, you know. But but if you're going, if you're pushing, if you're you know overdriving at a higher speed and you can still get to where you need to, that's not going to hurt you as bad. If you're at a really low speed and you're pushing, you know that that usually gets you where. Basically, the the spot that will cost you the most time on any course is screwing up the slow part. Because if you're offline and you're pushing in a really slow spot. And, and that's usually going to be more painful. Uh, for those that have done a, a, a Evo School Phase One, if you screw the Chicago box up, uh, you're pretty much done. I mean, because it's a if you come into it, if you overdrive it, the car pushes and you hit the cone on the exit. So you got to be patient. It's the slowest spot on the course, or the skid pad. 
a skid pad in the school is usually the, one of the slower spots of the school. If you make a, a mistake in this skid pad that you're only going maybe 15 or 20 miles an hour, but through this entire sweeping corner, you're now three feet off. Oh, it's so brutal on the clock, just massive. So, so back when I took the schools, is a good example of this. We, you know, Jean Kenzer, who used to own the school, she had, um, it, it, the timing system was horrendous, honestly. It was a cabled system. It, it didn't, all, it wasn't very, uh, it was accurate, but it just didn't always work all day long, let's just say that. Um, and the courses were more like figure eights, right? So, so they went over themselves, but it allowed us to have split times when the timer worked, which was nice. So when I took the schools, we actually had that system, and I was able to tell that went in two places where I made the most time was the slalom and the skid pad. In the slalom, when I did it my way the first time, I was eight-tenths slower by trying to do what my physics teacher would say and go straight. On a 60-foot slalom, I was eight-tenths slower by trying to go straight and just keep a slower, steady speed and then shoot out of it at the end. When I, my instructor was Larry Fine. He's an awesome guy. Still one of my favorite guys. I wish he ran more so I could have him instruct more because the guy is just phenomenal. Um, he's like, hey, humor me. I want you to try it out wider and dive in on the slalom and think about that left rear tire hitting the base of the first one and then the right rear tire hitting the base of the next one. And the third one, do the same thing. And as you come around and you're aiming for the fourth, I want you to then start squeezing on the throttle and you, I'll let you drive it however you want to the end for the last four and five, or cone four and five. And immediately, eight-tenths of a second faster. But I was like, so hold on a second. We just did an eight-second portion of this course, and I picked up eight-tenths of a second. Hey, really? He's like, yeah, you got that. You nailed it. Let's do the next, you know, let's now work on the skid pad. And what did you notice when you head out of that solemn? Now that you did it right, what happens to the skid pad? It's like, man, I blew it. I went right because I, my break point was off, right? I, I didn't, hadn't registered yet that I wasn't looking where I needed to be, so I'd know where to go. And so now we're doing the skid pad. And he gets me to run the skid pad nice, tight, and tidy. And when I ran it tight and tidy so that my inside tires almost hit every single cone, like literally wiggled every cone around the whole circle, when I did that, I picked up another half a second, even off of only being a foot off of the cones before. So I picked up another half a second by running this tighter line. And it was like, it felt slower, because mile an hour around that skid pad, it was slower. But mile an hour isn't the deal. It's about minimum distance at maximum load. I had I had maximized my load in the bigger circle, but I was further out. And it just takes longer, period. Even though it was only like a foot or so, it took longer. And I challenge and so people from that point forward. To, to draw a 180 and assume mm-hmm. their car is the tightest it can be. Then add five feet to that and see how much more distance you add. I've done that, and I'll, actually I'll put it online at yeah. some point. But that's that's when I was learning when I first started Coors Field. We always had a 180 at the end, and it was John Ames and people saying the tightest way through a 180 is the tightest line, unless you have a bank turn. He would say, but we don't have bank turns right. yet. So, but I would have a stopwatch, and I would do. Wow, David Fouth looks so slow. But if you stopwatch those people that look slow because they're on the tightest line, they'd be up to a second yeah. faster, just like you're saying in a half of a circle. Yeah. And I remember walking yeah. the course, which is going to tie in a question that somebody posted on Facebook for this interview. We'd be walking the course, and somebody in a turbo Evo back in the day is like, oh, I have to drive out here to get rotated, to point, to turn, to get the boost going. I'm like, you're going to add like 10 feet? Like, you would go 10 feet deeper than you would have to go for sure. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. It may feel good, but there's no way physics can justify that. And this leads into walking the courses and watching people. Jack has a question about, he walks the course, he figures out what he's going to do, and then he realizes the faster guys drive a different line. Now, I don't know if he's saying those faster guys walk the wrong line, but my first thought is follow the fast people. That's, I used to follow David Fouth and John Ames. I wouldn't ask, ask them many questions, but I would follow them like I was stuck behind them, 10 feet behind them. What do you suggest for people when yeah. it comes to walking courses if they don't think they're taking the right lines? Uh, I think that, well, if they don't think they're taking the right line, I'd say go find some, an Evo instructor and have them walk them through the course, honestly. But um, if... For me, I always walk, I try to walk the course where the driver's seat would be, and so I get a feel of what I'm actually going to see. I think that's really important. Um, and then as I'm walking, and and we do this in a phase one. I'm trying to get if anyone hadn't taken a phase one, they're going to 
I'm kind of giving you a little bit of a heads up here, but when we walk the people through the course in the morning, we actually, as we're walking them, we're alluding to where they should be looking at the whole time while we're walking, but we just don't tell them that until the meeting. And that's key, you know, like when you're, so if you have a, in like our phase one, it starts with a fall and then it heads you into a, a skid pad. When I get the cone three and a half where I'm squeezing on the throttle, I, I'll tell somebody, okay, I want you now to look up to the circle. I want you to look to the back of the circle. You know, I say back of the circle. There's other, you know, Sam would say, you know, he wants you to look at the, at the entry of the circle. Uh, I tell him to look at, say, the 12 o'clock, you know, the furthest cone away from me because I want to think a perpendicular thing like we talked about earlier. Um, I think those are, are things that are really important. Uh, so literally, I'm in one element, but I'm already looking at the next element. And I do that when I walk. Once I get, you know, if I'm walking around a sweeper at an event, once I've started coming around and I've already, you know, I've seen that exit and I know where the exit is and I know what the exit line is, I look at what's next. And how did I know what the exit line was? Because I looked at what's next. I know where I'm going from there. So, so remember when you walk, you just always look at what the next element is and that will determine where you walk right now or where your car needs to be right now. That's why looking ahead is so important in the car. Is is it's all about where you're going, not where you've been, or not where you are. Good point, and that's where where you are. Yeah, where you are. That was all determined by something behind you, and you can't fix it now. So you better look at where you're going uh, to make sure you don't screw that up. I, I love it. And when I walk in the course, I usually stop. And I, I always think of the pro solo courses at the finale. So we go out and we take a left or right. And when I was in the left hand course, I'm thinking. I get to a certain point and I start looking way left. I go, where am I going to look at when I'm here to have a clue what this next turnout is? And I usually find a cone or two and I go, oh, there's the cone. And I have to, I'm hoping I remember, I want to be on the backside of that cone. So really I'm looking for, I guess, what you'd probably call one of the key cones. I want to think how my car needs to be orientated when I get there. But I want my head and my video to turn, my whole helmet to turn and look over there. So I pre-program those look-aheads as I'm walking the course like you're saying. Like I'm here. I want to look over there. Oh, yeah, that's the key cone I want to see. And by the time you get to that element, what are you looking at next? Which leads me to the question, I think it was Sam says he's going to get in trouble when he was on the podcast. When you come to a slalom, how far are you telling us to look through it? Uh, You really ought to look at the end of it. You know, you should look to the very end because your peripheral vision is key, right? So, you know, it's... What I do in the school, I have a neat little trick I do when we do drive through throughs at lunchtime. We'll, we'll put three people in the car, and I'll tell them, all right, you know, when we're looking ahead in the afternoon, I want you to really just concentrate on, on what's ahead of you. So in this fall, I want you to look at the last cone of this five-cone fall, the one, you know, that's way down there, and they kind of look at you like, good God, you really do that? And so then after I go slowly through the course and show them what I'm looking at each time. The next time we go through, we, we kind of go through it a, you know, 50% clip or more. And I'll look at that. I'll look at the people in the back in the mirror, in the rear view mirror. I'll watch the two people sitting in the back seat. And I'm like, like you know, Solomon is about trusting your peripheral vision. So if I can look at you in the mirror, in the back seat and still drive this Solomon without hitting a cone at like 50%, what what's stopping you from looking at the end of the slalom and driving it hard? So you're saying peripheral kind vision, of look at you like, as in you're gonna look at the end but still see the cones coming up close to you. Correct. Okay, not correct. up to the sides. And you said that I'm like, the, what's he talking about peripheral? Not I'm not looking side. at the side. <laughs> no, no. So 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 the reality is in a slalom when you drive it, you should look to the last cone of the slalom and then drive it and let the per- look. You shouldn't look at the cone that's right in front of you because you know you're going to be close to it. Why am I going to look at it? Right? I'm guilty. I'm guilty. I know times. it's going to be close. <laughs> right. So so look at the end and trust your peripheral sees those and that knows you're you know in the right place and just go with it. Right. And then when you get to about three and a half, stop looking at the last cone and look at the next element. But in the in the school, what I do is to prove that your peripheral vision can get you through a slalom. Great, I look into the rearview mirror in the center of the car at the two people sitting in the back seat, and I drive a slalom at fifty percent or more. And if I can do that, I mean, don't get me wrong; it's not the most beautiful line. But if I can look at it in a mirror, looking at people in my back seat and drive to a slalom, there's no excuse why they can't look at the last cone of the slalom and go through that thing, you know, why, you know, as fast as they possibly can. There just should be no reason they can't do that. And they look at you like once you, 
Yeah. You know, when they're when you're driving a slalom and you're look, they're looking at you, look at them, and they realize that you're not pussyfooting around through the slalom. All of a sudden, they start to trust their peripheral vision, and that they're if they look that far ahead, they can do it. And it's it's a lot of fun. It's more of a fun, you know, like they don't believe you really look that far ahead. Well, okay, fine. I, I trust my peripheral vision so well that I can drive it without even looking at it. Yeah, no, and, and so that it kind of changes people's perspective as, wow, I can really look that far down the course and still see where I am now. Yeah, no kidding, because you're really seeing the things that are approaching, and I've only done that a few times. I think it may have been Brian Peters, one of the Evo instructors. Somebody was like, look all the way down the slalom. I'm like, oh, I don't really, I don't know if I do that. I might look two or three cones in. But it was amazing when I looked at the last cone how, as you go back and forth across, they all line up. And that's how I kind of yeah. knew. I was like, well, I, I don't usually see that because I don't look at that last cone. But when you do, they all come back in a line as you go back and forth and back and forth. So I hope to practice that more. And now that I get what you're saying in the peripheral is if I look at the last one, I should still be seeing the yeah. one I'm approaching and be able to gauge if I want to backside the first three or what, three and a half, what have you, and then go for it. Yeah. I, I highly encourage you if next time you set up a course or, or if you get – Let's just say you get a rerun somewhere and you got to drive through a, a course, okay? And if you go through a slalom and you're going that slow, just look at the last cone and just note it and just stare at it and watch in your peripheral how you can it. You'll see the course, the cone that you're near, and it's right where it needs to be. It's kind of strange, you know. As I tell people when they're driving that, I'm like, look, I'm looking at the end, but you see it go right by, right here. And look, I'm looking at the end, and I'm going by the next. Look, it just went by over there. You see it in your peripheral, and then they're like, "Oh man, it really is that." It's it's pretty. It's it sounds odd, but it, it really does work. Well, I mean, look, we we look ahead like this every day. I mean, it's like when you're driving around a, a exit ramp on a highway. That one we were talking about, you like to do it spiritedly on occasion. It's not like you're staring at the end of your hood. You know, you're looking around. It. Um, you know, when you when you're taking a left turn off of one road onto the next, and it's got a curbing at the end, you don't. You don't stare at that curb to make sure you don't hit it. You know, I, you, I might. Your peripheral sees it there. Yeah, it's, well, if I can figure out to do what you're talking about, I have the bad habit of noticing if the cones are in the box or out of the box a little bit because I'm scanning so much that I still scan at that cone where I'm at. Well, maybe it's five, ten feet in front of me, and I can't do much. I might, maybe I can move a millimeter, right? I can't do much about it, but I notice that. And honestly, at times it's distracting because then I want to point and honk the horn and say, fix that cone while I'm driving through the course. With what you're doing, I should have no chance of noticing it. That I shouldn't be seeing the chalk lines because I'm focused way far ahead. I'm really, truly looking ahead and relying on the peripheral closer up things of knowing where they're at just because they're so much closer. So that, that's going um, to be a good challenge for me. If anybody else is like me of, of yeah. noticing cones and boxes, we're probably focused too much on what's right there. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that I've... I notice cones out of the box. I do, but it's usually a cone at the end, like if I'm entering a sweeper, as I'm entering, I'll be looking at the exit cone and be like, and I'll stop at the entry of the, you know, of the sweeper and like point at the cone, like it's out of the box. Oh, it's okay. happened multiple times where, like I can notice that from that far away. I don't need to, you know, I can, I'll, I'll pick up on a cone being out of the box. I've gotten plenty of reruns like that. I, uh, Jim Murphy got mad at me once one day at a Peru event because I was going, I was setting up, I was entering, it was like a big left 180, a little straightaway that went to another 180. And as I was entering the first 180 and sweeping around, I saw him running across the course and I stopped. And I'm like, you're, he's in the course. Like I pointed at him like, cause he was in the course and he, and as I went by, it was like, you don't deserve a rerun. But the problem was, I was looking so far ahead that there was a guy in the course. And I wasn't there yet. But in my mind, I'm like, ah, that, that, you know, this isn't right. And, I mean, it, it really came because I was looking so far ahead that it completely threw my system off that there, there's this guy standing in the course. And and I stopped. Like, I got a rerun, and he went. I went by. He shook his finger at me. He's like, "You don't deserve a rerun." And, uh, <laughs> he, and maybe he, I did or didn't. I I don't really remember. But it was just like it was. As soon as I saw the guy in the course, like this isn't right. I stopped. It's kind of like I've seen course cones like that as well. You know, you see it out of the box from so far away, and you stop. And then people are like, "Well, you're not even up to it." I was like, "Yeah, but it's still out of the box." You know. That that's a good note for people to make because I probably don't see them that far ahead out of the box. I am. 
I don't know why, but I'm focused on them to make sure. I guess I'm kind of judging myself as I go by the cone is why I think I okay my scanning so close. I go, well, I was on that cone or I was off that cone. That's kind of what I feel like I'm doing as I'm noticing if the cones are in the box or not, which may not be necessary because it's probably a little too fine-tuned. But I definitely would tell people to experiment and try these different things. If you're doing one, try the other just to see. Just like you said, if you're entering slalom's flat, backside that first cone with more of a swishy arc like a snake and see if it takes off your time, especially if you can do practice days and you can time it, have these little sections timed. That's huge. Yeah, absolutely. Do you definitely take advantage of the practice courses? Yeah, exactly. Seat time, seat time, Evo school time. So, do you tell yeah. anybody about left foot, right foot? If someone was starting out or coming from go karts, would you treat them differently than if they were had never driven a go kart? Um, not really. I mean, the karting thing is is it's great for the kids um, to get a, a feel of motorsports and a feel of the sport itself. Um, the biggest thing I see is, so I, I did the school in Greenville. My son's going from a junior cart, and I put him through the school in the Z06. Here's this 15-year-old kid in the Z06. And he was there, and there was another guy who's just coming from F125 that was um, his going into uh, A Street. And, and both of these guys do the same thing, is the cart you can get away with things that you cannot get away with on a car because they make tons of grip when you lift. They slow down quicker. Um, what I found both of them doing was coming in the corners and not using the brakes. They just lift and turn. And that what the funny thing I found about Trey was Trey would spin. Now, now typically in a Z06, the average person spins on exit all the time because it's so much more power. You know, it's a 500, five horsepower car and this kid used to, you know, a five horsepower Briggs that, you know, maybe makes 18 horsepower. And, um, so he, he would, he didn't spin on exit very much at all. Like maybe twice, but on entry, he probably spun four or five times. And so I re- finally, after the other instructors rode with him, I jumped in and I realized that, he just throws it into the corner because, oh, hell, a cart would stick. Uh, you know, you had to remind him that this is 3,150 pounds, not 300 pounds. And, you know, you, you got to, you know, you use the middle pedal, you get it, get the nose set, then you can turn and go. And, and they did great. So that's the biggest difference from carts to cars is the weight. You, you know, learning the weight and the size. Obviously, I put them in the Z06 on the right side of my car. I had quite a few cone marks on it. Um... But other than that, I mean, there's not huge differences in approach. I mean, other you know, it's just smaller, So, but you still want to be on the back edge of the cones if you can. I mean, ultimately, the carts can get away with doing things not perfectly. But if you were still going maximum, you know, velocity, you know, I'm sure that Paul, Paul Russell is still trying to backside edge of the cones uh, when he's going out there and, and getting it done. So... I don't think that that line is much different. Uh, I do think it's a little different, but not a whole lot different. And I still say it's slower in, faster off. Uh, it's funny you mentioned Paul Russell. We will find out from him in the podcast after yours. Nice. Awesome. I like Paul. He's a very nice guy and, and a, a hell of a shoe, that's for sure. No kidding. Oh, yeah. Let me come back to your overall win, just like Paul's won some overalls. <laughs> so one thing you just yeah. noticed about from carts to Z06s, I kind of found the same thing going from the Civic to the Porsche GT3 last year, I was overdriving the speed into these turns. And John Ames got in the car and said, what am I doing wrong? I'm not keeping enough weight on the nose. He's like, you just overdid it. And I think that not yeah. only the weight, so my Civic's what, under 2,000 pounds, the Porsche 3,000-something, but also the mm-hmm. extra amount of speed, thus momentum, that car gets going. You have to brake, even though it's got phenomenal brakes and anti-lock brakes, I needed to be slowing down more then I realized, plus the physics were saying, and maybe this is true for carts too, some carts can probably go through some tight turn maybe faster than a Z06? Uh, I'm sure. Well, I mean, the, the advantage that a Z06 has is it accelerates like crazy. It stops really good, but it accelerates really good. And, you know, the, the GT3, it turns like nothing you've ever driven. So, um, and it stops amazingly. So, you know, that's, to me, the, the Z06 has a lot of stuff. Like, from a dead stop, the GT3 takes off better. Coming out of the corner, though, I don't necessarily think the GT3 works any better than the Corvette. Um, 
you know, but depending on especially on on our compound tires. But there's a, there's a little differences here and there, but you have to the the ability to turn in a GT3 is amazing. Um, the slaloms are a hoot in a GT3. I, I wish I could say I ever figured it out, but. I, yeah, even though it was Sam and Chili saying, oh, should, you should lift here. It's going to rotate or add gas. I'm like, you're talking like a Civic. We never got, at least for me and my style, to do that. Like, it wasn't loose enough, which I, I will tell people, if you're setting one up for the track versus autocross, evidently you've got to change quite a bit of that to have it where it would be really scary or undrivable on the track. But evidently on the autocross course, they kept saying, you're going to lift and it's going to rotate. But well, then, then yeah, maybe uh, maybe in a GT3, I don't change my cars a lot from as far as Corvettes. Yeah, um, I might take a little bit of the toe away from them for the track, yeah. but but I don't uh, I don't really change them a whole lot. You know, I think autocross car, like especially if you're time trialing a Corvette, and you can take that thing there with autocross set up, and you'll hammer up some fast laps. I mean. Uh, we ran the Optima event with a car that was set up to autocross at Daytona. It's 170 miles an hour in a V06 in the corners, and it was stuck like glue. So um, the only thing we changed, we took a little wing off of it for the track. Yeah, or spoiler, you know, say wing, but a little bit smaller spoiler for the track just so we didn't have so much drag. Um, and the same thing when I, used to, when I had my old ASP car back when the Z06s were in ASP. Uh, I would go and time trial at VIR all the time, and and uh, I didn't really change much other than the toe. I would, I'd just tow, you know, I just didn't want to drag the, you know, down the straight so much. So, so you would basically but, make it more straight in the rear? Yeah, well, okay. everywhere. I wouldn't, okay. I wouldn't have a whole lot. I'd pretty much set the toe at zero for the track, and then for autocross I'd have maybe as eighth inch of toe out at the very most and, and maybe an eighth inch in in the rear. But I just set them at zero so the car going down the straightaway it wasn't really you know scrubbing speed not that zero six really scrubs a lot of speed but i didn't want it to turn in crazy fast you know either so i took that so out of the front but i tell you what I, to me a, a, a corvette is is the most fun car ever because it can do it anything you know and then when you want to drive on the street it's very it can be very tame as long as you drive it like you should and uh not my old Corvette though. My my seventy one is not so. That's not really friendly street car because you can't talk to anybody. <laughs> you can't so hear anybody. Oh god, yeah, I can't even think, my, hear myself think when I drive that. <laughs> oh gosh. Oh, something. May, this is not keeping it simple, but what do you think about how important is lifting versus braking when you're autocrossing? Uh, again, it's just what your eyes see. You know, it's, if, if you if you think you can get away with a lift and you're looking at it at the corner and as you lift, you feel that the car is, is going to commit to the corner that you, or the, the element that you want it to get to, then, then that's fine. I mean, lift versus brake is really comes down to, to, to what you see. If, if you look at it and you, you should be able to look at the corner and look at the element and know if you need to, to, you know, lift or break. And you're making the decision more to, on how fast you're going, knowing that a lift is going to slow you down a little bit or maybe help you rotate a little bit versus I need to slow down a lot. So I'm use the brake. Yeah. I mean, honestly, usually a lift, if I, you know, I it, depends, it just all depends on the scenario, really. You know, we, if we have a specific course we're talking about, we might be able to pinpoint which would be better, but it really comes down to what you see. I mean, oh, you know, lifting. Okay. So, so it depends on how much weight you need on the front. So a lift is going to put a little bit of, of weight transfer to the front. A brake is going to put a whole lot of weight transfer to the front. So how much weight do you need on the front? Are you lifting just to get the car to bite a little bit to get you know a little bit of of, of, of steering input, or do you if you do if, or if you do that and you make the steering input, is the car going to then push? So therefore, you needed to brake. I mean, it, it just depends on the scenario. It it's hard to. It's hard to pinpoint unless you're, we have a specific element we were talking about. You know? hey, that's fine. I'm really um, asking because I, being a left foot breaker most of the time, I don't really have a lift. I break right. or I break and accelerate and break, <laughs> but it's always breaking. Yeah. And yet I'm trying to, especially in the GT3 the last couple of times, put the left foot to the side and have that, even a lift in between the time of letting off the gas and braking honestly seemed to help that car. 
so it's something I keep saying every year, I'm going to work on this, I'm going to work on this, I'm going to try this more and more, just to see what it can do. And as you're saying, depending on what you're doing, you, you will or will not, by looking ahead, you'll know what you need. Or if you need to rotate or something in the front wheel drive, maybe lift hard and turn. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it all just kind of depends on the situation still. It's hard to – hard to. I'm a right foot breaker. I can lift foot break. I just don't usually. I only time I ever lift foot break is is probably on the track. Or maybe an occasion at Baja, uh, I did that some in, in the thousand. We were running a thousand, whether it was pre-run or race stuff. And then, um, you know, I was just out at what used to be Miller Motorsports Park, but Utah Motorsport Campus. We're doing the Ford Racing School out there, and there was a corner there that I would left a break a little bit on, just because it was one of those that. I'm going to scrub a little speed, but I wasn't going to downshift. So, I mean, I just I just don't do it. I think the thing with level braking for autocrossers is so huge that people need to understand is it takes years and years of practice to be great at it. And 95% of the people that do it aren't good at it. And so they over brake all the time. Then aside from over braking, they're typically not smooth. And it, it upsets the car more than it helps the car. Um, so the, I stay away from it. I can do it. And if somebody really is like, can you do it? I, you know, would you do it? I, I will, but I just don't, you know, think it's something you need. I do realize there's, that some front-wheel drive cars uh, that are really loose by just dragging a little left-up brake on it will keep them more settled. Uh, but to those that have that scenario, my suggestion would be don't set your car up so loose. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but you know, that's it or prepare yourself earlier for the element that makes it loose. Just like I was talking to you about Zimmer's, uh, Volkswagen rabbit, you know, I knew it was loose. I could have left foot, but they all left foot brake in the car. I think I'm pretty sure they were, um, you know, I could have probably done that to help. But I just, in my mind, it's like, hey, every time you're going to lift off the cast, just make sure your input on the steering wheel is smoother. Don't be so aggressive, because if you're aggressive on the input, then you're going to you're going to more than likely get the thing turned around. So I just mentally prepared for that. Uh, I anticipated that what I was going to do, and I stayed with the plan, and it, and it worked out really well. No kidding. And this reminds me of something I didn't ask earlier. For rural drive, high horsepower about being easy in the throttle. Watching some videos of some of the people that you compete with, it's amazing to see that actually it seems like they open the wheel right before they mash the gas. Like their Absolutely. anticipation is so key that they are able to, hey, I'm about to mash this gas pedal, so I'm going to open the wheel, I don't know how many degrees, and they get on the gas yeah. hard, almost knowing to step a little bit, but because the tires are pointed, off they go. Yeah. Yeah, that's really important. It, you know, as I... So about the, the difference between in 05 when I ran the Elise and, and then in 05 I bought my, my first Z06, the difference between those two was, one, I was scared to get out of the gas, one, I was scared to get into the gas, right? <laughs> and so I found that in the Elise, again, I would anticipate and start to unwind the wheel or counter steer on lift before I actually lifted so that I would not have to chase the car so bad trying to keep the tail behind me. And then the Corvette, when I time to get on the gas, I'd start to unwind the wheel a smidgen early and then get on the gas. I wouldn't have to chase the rear end so far on exit. Um, it's the pulley system, but it, we're just we're just anticipating the pulley system, if that makes any sense. We're just tar- starting to unwind that wheel even sm- sooner. The pulley meaning your um, steering pul- wheel and gas pull are connected by a string or a pulley and a string. Correct. Yeah. And Correct. Think- so let, let's think about this. If if in theory every time we turn the wheel in an autocross, we should be at the maximum limit or the maximum load the tire could sustain at that given moment, correct? Yes. In theory, if we were driving as fast as we could. So if that's the case and you're going around a sweeping corner and you are going to give it gas, if you held the steering wheel straight then jumped on the gas, what would happen? Yeah, Immediately not- the car would either pu- it would push if it was front-wheel drive. Or if it was rear wheel drive and it had enough power, as long as you jumped on the gas early, it would actually start to step the tail out. So if you thought there's a rope that ties your foot to the steering wheel that was always tight, that means that every time you lift off the gas, then you can turn, and as you get on the gas, it actually pulls the steering wheel towards straight. 
It doesn't mean it has to be straight. It just means that as you roll on gas, you need to take more bind out of the wheel because, in theory, we're at the maximum load those tires could take. So we have to pull bind out of the wheel. And, and if we always remember that, then we typically will not have as much push or loose conditions. And so for us, uh, the guys in Corvettes, you know, we've learned immediately, like, unwind the wheel. As soon as you think about the gas pedal, you need to start unwinding the wheel. Yeah, and that's where maybe if it was a bungee instead of a string or something that's not flexible, <laughs> you, okay, guess what? We're about to mash the gas pedal, but we don't want, well, I guess you don't even need, no. You could have something that is perfectly rigid, whereas you can't mash that gas pedal, and at least not very, at all, until you unwind the wheel. In this case, unwind it early, give it half an inch of slack, and then mash the gas pedal down as you keep unwinding, or as you said, unbinding, I think, the wheel. So yeah. going back to what's yeah, straight. Actually, actually, that's a great way to say it is unbinding the wheel because basically you're, that's what you're doing. You're just making sure that, that you don't overwhelm the contact patch, you know. Here's the guys, you know, I, I'll tell people all the time when we were doing the RE Driver Enough Tour last year when, with BF Goodrich and, and you could listen to the competition's tires. They go out and drive our car first on, on this, this comp two all season and, and the tire worked awesome you know and then they they get in the exact same car but just have a different brand on it you know whether it was a continental or a yokohama or whatever and they would try to drive that car the same way and and you could listen to the contact patch just become not flat anymore i mean just would it would just tear the contact patch up because they would overwhelm the sidewall of the tire by having you know getting on the gas too hard and it would it would actually deform the, the contact patch and then the tires would just scream at you, you know, aside from visually driving, you know, we need to drive audibly too, listening to those tires, you know, the tires just barely making any chatter. It's pretty damn close to all you got. But if it starts screaming at you, you're, you're either got too much gas or too much wheel or maybe both. Um, so you, you've got to learn how to drive with all of your senses, what you see, what you hear, what you feel. Um, you got to use it all. I'm so glad you. I wrote down noise. I was like, "What do yeah. you think about?" And that's where let's get into a little bit of this. Uh, Rival 1.5 versus Rival. Do you have any suggestions? Let's say we're coming from a different tire to these for setup. Do you know if people take out spring? Do they add spring? Any thoughts no, on these? I, I don't think I don't think this spring is as much. Although the, the 1.5 has a uh, a stiffer sidewall, I believe, and it. it's got a higher load range. Let's put it that way. Uh, as much as I do have a lot of contact with BFG, they didn't tell me exactly what they did, but I can read the side of a tire and I can see that there's a higher load range on it. Um, I don't know that spring is as much big a deal as maybe some shock changes would, would be good for that tire. But I can tell you when we tested, uh, I drove an FRS, a, a stock FRS, one of McGeorge's cars that he ran a couple of years ago, and we made no changes they, they put me in the regular Rival S, uh, regular Rival S on a brand new sticker set. We went out, we made three runs on, on the Nationals Test and Tune course, although we did change that first slalom to be equally spaced, like 13 cones. It was kind of a crazy slalom. Um, we took three runs, and then we came back, put a sticker set of 1.5s on. And uh, the first run I went out, I turned in, just like I did in the previous runs on the other tire, and I had to double turn for every single cone because the car reacted so quickly. It turned in so fast that, and I didn't hit a cone, but every single cone of a 13 cone slalom I had to turn twice for. And because my timing was off. And I came back before they told me any time difference or what it was. I was like, oh my God, this thing turns like nothing I've ever seen. It, it really? It's like, how bad was that? And they're like, you just tied your fastest time on the rival S. They're like, excuse me? And they were like, yeah, it was the same time you ran your fastest run in the Rival S. I was like, oh, okay. Wow, really? Yeah, so next run I went out, and I was nine-tenths faster than the Rival S on the 1.5. Um, and then, then they started asking me feedback. And one of my, my biggest pieces of feedback was, I don't think I want a Corvette to turn like this. I would be afraid. It's not so much that the turn. I think I can accomplish this same kind of turn in on a Corvette. But my fear was if they built rear tires like that, 
that I would not be able to keep the car behind me because, I mean, it was amazing difference in how the tire acted and reacted. Um, in a Corvette that goes, any car that goes that fast, uh, under throttle, if it would react that quickly, it would be, it would have your full, you know, say it has, they have your full attention anyway, but it would require a whole nother level of attention. So, um, I, I don't know, I don't know that I necessarily had uh, any impact on what they did with the tire. It comes down to the way the rivals are made, the rival and the rival S and the rival 1.5. Because they have three rib tires and four rib tires for the wider sizes, I think it, it was more about uh, molds and things. That's why they didn't do the larger sizes. Uh, I can tell you without question, it's an amazing tire. I got two of them for my my kid Civic that he has, and uh, we're going to do a little mix match setup. We're going to run 1.5s on the front, and then uh, regular rival S's on the rear. Because I don't, hey, think, hey, I was I don't think try that that's that. needed. Don't, don't tell everybody. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't. I since the back of those cars are just uh, since they're just trailers anyway. I don't think it really matters. But um, they're awesome tires, and, and you know, one of the things that has been awesome with with BF Goodrich is their ability to to want feedback, you know, and, and give back to the community, whether it's, and that doesn't just apply, you know, to us solo people, uh, to the off-road community, uh, to the road course people. I mean, they, they listen, they do what they can, but, you know, unlike, you know, I, I'll pick on the gorilla in the room a little bit, unlike Hoosier where they have, you know, they only make race tires. So it really, they can get away with building tires a little differently than, than BF Goodrich. BF Goodrich really has to stay true to the DOT tire, you know? Um, and, you know, they're not a, they don't make as many different tires as other companies. So, you know, they really have to have tires that, that meet certain requirements uh, over what some brands are doing. So I love them. I love the tires. I, I love being a part of the program. I think that they're great people and, I think that, you know, the first set, this is a true story, the first set of tires I ever bought to autocross on were a set of Comp TAs um, back in 1987, and then my first set of R compounds were uh, the G-Force, uh, what was it called? I think it was a G, the G-Force TA, Comp TA or something, I can't remember, it was a long time ago. Uh, but so my first set of real race tires, whether R compound or or more street oriented, were BF Goodrich. Been been with them for a long time. So that I was asking those yeah, questions. Yeah, I've, I've been on them a long time. I did play on some others for a while. You know, I, I you know when I was because you know the, here's one thing I love about BF Goodrich is in in '99 when they had that G Force tire, um, it was R1. So it was B Force R1, and uh, it became. They saw what was happening, and they didn't have the ability right then to to make the tire better at that time frame. And they saw what was coming down the pike from other brands. And and this is to me gives me so much respect for a company like them is that they knew that it was better to take the tire away and 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 step back until they could bring something to the table that could run at the front again. Um, than it was to stay there and kind of become irrelevant, you know what I mean? And everybody's driving on everybody else's stuff, but your tire's still there, but nobody wants it. It would make more sense to go back and let's go back to the drawing board and come back with something that's better. And so when they did come back and they brought not just a rival, but then they brought, you know, a better R1S as well. It was like, and then, you know, now even updating the rival to the rival S and now the 1.5, it's showing that, look, these are people that they want to be the best. And we've got a they've got a plan laid out for revisions to their tires, um, and, and it's pretty awesome to know that it's a company that cares. You know, there's a lot of brands out there. Uh, you know, I don't want to pick on any, so I won't name them. But there's other brands out there that that don't have a program laid out where they can actually bring out the next you know generation of their tire to be better because financially it's just not something they can do. Um, so for us at BFT, we're kind of lucky that that you got a group that that gets it, understands it, understands motorsports, and and um, 
and isn't afraid to to take some chances on some things. And I tell you, a car, a tire that we I've got to drive on. Well, not very many people would. Robbie Foley would be a great guy to tell you about. Um, the tire they use in the in the Global MX5 Cup, the the the, the be a good rich racing slick. I did a program with uh, Randy Popes, and we were doing aggressive, you know, Mr. Aggressive versus Mr. Smooth driving. Right. I and, saw that uh, one. I was Mr. Smooth, and he was Mr. Aggressive. And we, we sat there, and he's like, man, this tire's so good. I can't make it do anything wrong. And, uh, you know, so so we had a lot of fun. But it was like they made this tire for MX, for the Global MX-5 Cup that's just I told them, I was like, man, I'd almost be willing to run that tiny little tire on my Corvette. That's how good that tire is. So it was it was pretty awesome. It was like having Velcro in the corners. <laughs> that's that's when I drove the EP Civic on a fun run. Oh my goodness! Talk about Velcro tracks or something. I was like, turn wheel go. I'm like, wow. Yeah. Insane. Awesome so so yeah. I'm gonna circle back to mental game in between runs before runs. What do you do yourself? Especially if that differs in anything that you tell people to do as a as a student. Well. A lot of times we'll run a camera and then uh, and then we'll go and and look at runs, you know, on the camera and see. I I like that over the data. I don't. It's not that the data doesn't help me. It's just that you know I, the data that I was using was was race keeper stuff, which I love. Um, and now you know I don't have the most up to date one. I haven't, I haven't you know bought another one recently. And uh, I just feel like there's there's a, not a lot of time really between runs, and I don't want to sit there and just concentrate on this. And when I can really, you know, think about what I'm doing and just drive to my abilities, and then watch the run and and see where I made my mistakes, and then and go back and really concentrate on that. I find that uh, I don't know easier uh, than sitting there and just examining the data and the, you know like. Because to me, it's not that the data doesn't do anything for you. It really does. It, it, it's great. But, you know, I know. I've been doing this. I'm 46. I'll be 47 in May. I've been doing it since, you know, I was 17 years old. So, I mean, I know when I made a mistake. I mean, uh, having an incident as a kid, I, I, I crashed a car on the street like a dummy one time. And uh, and I, it really taught me a lesson. It's like I drove on this one corner all the time, all the time. I knew how fast the car could go through there. But one night I decided that I was going to try to do it faster because I just thought I could. You know, well, Mike, you knew what your limit was. And I literally was like two miles an hour faster, and it was bad news. And, and I, you know, from that point forward, it's like, Mike, you know what the limits are. So, you know, you if you... I've been lucky, and, and a lot of us have been lucky enough to, like, get been born with some weird sense of feel and touch and 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 be able to know when something's at its limit when it comes to a vehicle. And and so just don't drive over that, you know, and, and think things through. It's really important in life to just think things through, whether it's driving or, or you know, any kind of decision. Make sure you're thought, well thought through. I'm writing that down is why the pause is here in life. Think things through. <laughs> I, I love, I yeah. love the tips and so much I've even thought I'm like, I could probably write us a, a really, not even a book, but really short thing about planning by looking ahead in autocross versus looking ahead in life and having a plan and be working yeah. towards something, improving, trying to improve. It, it's all the same. I, so many things are the same of how can you attack any game and how can you attack autocross as a game and then life or business. I really think business usually has yeah. rules, just like autocross, and how can you get the most out of that? So on the mental side, absolutely. you kind of hit on this earlier. So basically between runs, you're going to think about probably a couple things if you know you messed them up and try to focus on being better at them. Do you do anything to be calm or get excited? Is there any time that you're thinking uh, something differently there? Or? Not really. I'm not really a superstitious person. I, I do. I do this probably kind of weird, but I like I find that before I run, and, if, and, and I don't have a lot of video out anymore. I just don't really post much of it anymore. But uh, I almost, it's like I get sweaty palms and I have this thing about like wiping the steering wheel down with my hands and then wiping my hands on my pants. And then it's like, I don't mean to do it. It's not even like it's, 
it's not like if I didn't do it, I would freak out, but I, I find myself doing it all the time, and then Candy will point it out sometimes, like, there you go again. You know, it's like I just get sweaty palms. I don't like to wear gloves necessarily when I drive, because aside from, you know, I don't want to look like that guy, but uh, um, I just don't necessarily care to, unless I'm, you know, in a race car or some scenario like that, and we're fire or, you know, you know, Baja, you wear all that stuff too, because just, God, if you didn't, you'd be just covered in dirt. But, um, you know, just, I don't really do a lot of that. I just go out there and I, you know, on occasion I might crank up something crazy music just to be funny. I, I'm just a laid back person, really. I mean, I don't, I don't get amped up. I mean, there's, there's people out there that like you just don't want to talk to before they run, and I'm not that guy. I don't care. I could if you were the starter, I might carry on a conversation with you, and then you know at a pro solo with the light going down, it would be nothing for me if I if you were a friend of mine and we were running in the same class, I might pull up to the light with the with like some just ridiculous music playing, just to see if it would mess with you, and I'm just going to be laughing and I'll keep it on until the buzzer goes off. You know, and this, uh, I've had that with Sam and I have done that together. J- Kevin Younger's, you know, a bunch of us used to do that in the old F stock days. And then like literally until the, until the clock goes off and, you know, Howard will be working the tree and he's like laughing, like, I can't believe he's got, it. you know, I just, I just don't take it so serious because first off, if you can't stay laid back, you're going to be more relaxed. You're going to drive better. If you get so amped up that you're, you'll beat yourself before you ever get out of the start. So... When I, uh, it was funny when I did that TV show set up with Courtney years ago, the first race we went to, uh, first or second race we were at, I remember him coming over to me. I'm in the car and I had fallen asleep in my Hans. So like my, I was laying with my head with the Hans at full lock, you know, kind of holding my head up. And he comes over, he's like, are you okay? Are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. What's going on? What's wrong? What is it? He's like, well, why are you feel bad? You know, I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. What? He's like, what are you doing? I was like, uh, sleeping. You know, you're sleeping. And he's like, but you're getting ready to race. I'm like, yeah. You know, to me, a race car is like my happy place. You know, I don't, I don't need to get all amped up because that's where I want to be anyway. <laughs> you know, so um, if I sat and I thought about it, maybe I would, but I just try not to think about it. I just go out there and, and try to stay laid back and. And, uh, and do my thing. It sounds like basically you know yourself well enough to know you perform well being laid back and relaxed. And everybody should think about yeah. that, not just copy what somebody else does. How do you perform your best? Right. It's just like I think they told you in school if you were going to study, you need to study however you were going to be when taking the test. Same thing I think when you're practicing. And that's where the local events are like practice events for most of us. Can we be the same way? Yeah. And that's for me at nationals. Can I just? It's the same thing. Walk the same number of times. Realize you're going to be walking more or longer or be walking back and forth through your paddock, but really just get back to that same routine that you know you do well with. Yeah. On the walking thing, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that, you know, I wouldn't do more than five walks ever and, uh, and just make them count, you know. Now, sometimes when we used to do the seminars, we would walk a lot more so we could talk about what we were going to tell other people, but... Um, I mean, even at nationals, what I do is I'll I'll walk both courses first, both of them, like one, then the other, and then whatever course I'm going to walk, run first, I'll go run, walk that like you know maybe three, four more times, and then I won't walk anymore, and I won't walk that <clears throat> the second day course until I've already run on the first day. So I don't ever walk the second day's course more than you know more than four times, five times, that's for sure. Yeah, that, I think you just overthink, you know, if you, if you overthink it, you beat yourself before you ever start. And do you ever challenge people in schools to, or do y'all change the course where they don't know where they have to look ahead? Because at times I will just not walk. And I, oh, absolutely. Part of, part of the phase two, we, we changed the course on them three times during the day. So they have four different course configurations and they only walk it once in the morning. So they, they have no idea other than the fact that I make them stand there and I talk them through what the course is going to be and the changes. And then I make them close their eyes and think about it. And then I make them go and drive it. And it's amazing. They do fine. They do fine. And in a challenge school, it's the same thing. Except for this time in a challenge school, in that final session, what we do is we go make a change in the course. And then the instructor goes out 
with the student's car first and lays down a time on a course none of us have seen, really, or a, or a configuration that we have never used, and then lay a time out and then make the student come and get it. That's a challenge, come and, you know, come and beat us. And uh, what you find is they do great. You, you know, Once you start to teach people the right approach, they do awesome. But if they're going in blind, you know, it's tough. You know, um, it's, it's just like everything else, you know. Tell me this. What do you do best at autocross, whether now or in the beginning? What, what do you do best? Teach. Nice. And how long were you a natural teacher? Are there things people can learn to teach? Did you learn just because you kept doing it and you learned from good instructors? What kind of helps people there? Uh, I don't know. I think that I'm pretty good at communicating with with others. You know, I'm kind of a personable guy. I don't, I don't know a stranger type guy, and that helps me. Um, I'm a good read of people, and so if a guy is an engineer, I'll know how to talk to that guy. If a guy tells me he's a house painter, I can talk to him. Um, I think that really helps. I don't think in any this this bothers me a lot when people are like, "Who's instructing?" You know, and if you say a guy who happens to maybe not have a championship, and they him and haul, well, I want so and so, and I just laugh because I'm telling you without question, my favorite instructor I've ever had was Larry Fine. I can't express that enough. The guy was just phenomenal. And he never drove my car more than 80%. But I am, And I was faster than him every run. But the thing that killed me was that he effortlessly drove right on my heels. And I knew he wasn't giving it at all. And I was like, that drove me crazy. I was like, how is this guy? I'm watching him. He's so laid back. He's so relaxed. He's right on my heels, and I'm busting my ass to go this fast. Like, I don't, I think, God, what could he really do? And then my other instructor, I'm, I'm not going to say who he was, but he, he does the road racer, road racer now. And he knew me, and so he he really drove hard. Like, I, and now looking at it, he was driving 110 percent, 115 percent. And was he faster than me? Yes, but he also he really overdrove some. And and so that's why, you know, at the schools, I don't, no instructor should ever drive a student's car over 85% because there's no reason. We should be able to effortlessly drive as fast as them if you just go out there react, relax. And even if you're not faster, it doesn't matter because we're not there to see how fast we can go. It's to get them to drive effortlessly and fast. And so I think those are their keys to making you a great instructor. It's not don't get keyed up and, and don't have a, any kind of agenda. It's just about making these people faster and having a good time. That, that's an interesting challenge there, not to overdrive their cars. I can really see that if you're not overdriving, you have more time to point things out to them and to talk to them and for them, honestly, to even react to see. And that reminds me when you are talking earlier, if I'm riding with somebody, I am mostly making myself look way ahead. And if somebody rides with me, I'm usually trying to point with one hand. I'm looking there, I'm looking there, and I'll, I'm looking over there to try to let them know I'm really trying to look way ahead if I think they're newer and not doing that. I don't know if you have the same tips right. or not, but I just want to throw that in that when you're talking, I was like, oh, yeah, when I'm riding, I am trying to look way ahead. And whenever I oh, yeah. am driving, same thing, I want these people. And if I'm sitting in passenger side, sometimes my hand goes in front of their face like, that's a 180. Look over there. Because your helmet needs to turn somewhat to see at some point, at least. For me, a lot of times I'll just cheat. I'll look one time, it's in my mind, and then I'll scan back somewhere not quite as far. That may be a little overkill, but I'm like, oh, can I at least know where the exit is once again? Yeah. Oh, it would be nothing to, like, grab the back of someone's helmet, kind of like palming a basketball and kind of rotate their head while they're driving. So, hey, I want you to look there. You know, so it, it, it's really important. Um, you know, locally, when I'll, I'll jump in on somebody locally, I don't run a lot of local events that much, but when I do, or even if I'm, let's say, at a good guy's event and somebody needs some help, you know, I just tell them what to look at. I don't even, I don't get into where you need to be on the course or anything, but just if I'm trying to give somebody quick pointers, it's look here, look here, look here, look here, look here. And I would say 95% of the time, just doing that, they come back and they're like, oh, my God, that was my fastest run all day. I was like, great job. Here's my website. And, you know, boom. Because <laughs> it really, if you just get them to look in the right spot. But the thing is, just telling somebody to look ahead for the average person, they just don't know what to look for. So that that becomes a little bit of a, 
a challenge as well. And then, you know, they do great at the schools, but then the next course they go to is different. So they have to then start to learn how to analyze a course when they walk it to know what is, you know, as you said earlier, the key cones, because because those are the ones that are important. Everything else needs to kind of go away. Yeah. So tell us just a little bit about the Baja 1000. I am I can't really imagine doing that because I think it would beat me up and down so crazy bad. How, how was that? It's really not as it's not as bad as you would think. Although some things, like some of the rocky sections are pretty pretty brutal. Um, it's the most fun. I would absolutely, without question, if I could, I would take every piece of asphalt driving I've ever done and throw it out the window and only race off road. The is, challenge, is, the fun. What, it, why? Why? What's different? It's just awesome. I, it, it, honest to God, it's hard to explain how awesome it is. Um, it is sort of like an autocross in that you never see the same thing twice. You could you could pre-run a section and then turn around and go pre-run the same section again, and every corner would be slightly different because other people had come through and and changed the way the surface is. Um, autocrossers, in my opinion, are fabulous uh, off-road or Baja type racers because of our abilities to look ahead and react uh, quickly and controlled. Um, it's very similar in that aspect. Um, it is uh, the I I love Baja Mexico. Uh, it's just a, a awesome place where people are so nice. Um, if you if you ever get an opportunity to go uh, to that area, you should. It's just the, the people are fabulous. The the food is good. They love and respect life a little differently than than we do. I think because they don't have as much, so they're more appreciative of what they have. Uh, you got little kids on the side of the road, and it's the funniest thing. They'll hold these signs and. It'll say stickers, S T E E K R S, stickers. That's all they want are stickers. You could give a child a sticker, no matter what it said, and you might as well have given them a five dollar bill or something. It's just like it's just a love and appreciation of life that's different. Um, it is, you know, my buddy Andrew Comrie Picard. He calls it. It's a. It's like a twenty four hour plane crash. Is what Baja is. It is. It is nothing but controlled chaos. Uh, I learned a hard lesson the first year there. Uh, had got in the car with like a half an hour lead, and a couple hours later had put another hour uh, on second place, who happened to be our teammates. Um, and clipped a rock. You know, my Kyle Tucker was riding with me. He said, man, I think you. I can't believe we can get a flat. Well, 10 minutes later, the tire went down. So we got out, we changed it. We get back in and we're driving along and I just went a little too fast through a G out, like a big dip, you know, uh, like think like creek bed, you know, you run down and up in a creek bed. I went through that too quick and the whole right front suspension collapsed. And I spent the next 18 hours stuck in the desert oh. and, you know, got to watch the rest of the race and there's our teammates finally caught. We were out in the middle of nowhere, so there's no real radio communication until they were within a really close range to us. And so we had to wait 18 hours, and so I, I learned a big lesson there. It's like, first off, the most important thing is moving as fast. Um, if I knew my teammates were second, and they had another hour or two hours over third, like, I didn't need to drive. And, and honest to God, I was probably only driving maybe 70%, but I didn't, I just needed to get, it was in the middle of the night, so I just needed to get through the night, you know, and through the, just keep the car moving. And uh, so I learned a pretty valuable lesson from that. And uh, then I just went back this year, and uh, we were lucky enough to win. But, um, you know, it was a whole different approach to driving. It was just, you know, moving as fast. And, you know, as much fun as it is, um, unless you have to, you just don't drive hard when it's a 1,000 miles. You know, at pre-run, we had a whole lot of fun. Because in the pre-run, it's you learn in the course, but you you know when it's not your section you're driving, you can go out and drive kind of hard. And if something breaks, there's a crew of guys that can help you out and fix it, and it's right there, they're with you. But in the race, you just can't do that. And my favorite thing on that uh, is they had a section that's kind of like, I would assume it's kind of like running up Pikes Peak, it was all gravel road for like 
I don't know how many miles, I can't remember how many miles it was, quite a bit. And like if you made a mistake turning left and you went off the right side of the road, you'd just die. And then if you, on the other side, it was up a mountain, you know, so it was, it was awesome. Gravel road, just, you know, fast, fun. And then, but I, I don't know why, but I really like whoop de doos And there's sections that'll be like eight to 12 miles and nothing but whoop de doos And if you have a car that's working right, and and, uh, and feeling good, you'll get a rhythm, and you can kind of just just time it, where you just you know you, you launch it and you hit one, and you drive down the next one, and you jump the next one. I mean, you just it's like doing doubles, you know, on a motocross. I assume it's just I'm not a motocross guy or anything, but you know you just get a rhythm. And then pre-run this year, I really had a, a hoot on those and ran all my teammates down, and and uh, that was fun. Um, so tell but us really quickly, end, do you pre-run every section ahead of time or no? Well, so because it would be financially tough to be able to just have, you know, for the four days of pre-run, if I only ran my section over and over and over again, which would be ideal, but financially, that's a really tough thing to do. So what we do is, and the other thing that's huge, and we learned that this year, you know, some of us got really sick. And so you may end up driving a section that wasn't yours to start with. You know, because so you need to really know the whole course because you don't know if somebody's going to get sick or somebody gets hurt and and you end up driving something else. So, um, I mean, in a perfect world, you would want to run your section a bunch of times. How many miles is your section? Know the rest of it. How many miles is your section? Uh, well, so I'm going to say 250 of it. And you, you, you get know, to pre-run 250 like, of it? You get to drive that section. No, we run pre- we run the whole thousand. I mean, and this year's this past year was uh, eight hundred and eighty some miles uh, race. Uh, next year, I, I before the fiftieth anniversary of the thousand, it's supposed to be I believe it's thirteen hundred miles. <laughs> so, um, so but yeah, I mean it's just different, you know. And and you gotta you start in Ensenada, and the, for this year's course, it was what they call a loop course. So you. You start in Ensenada and you and you go, you know, down uh, halfway down the coast, the peninsula, and then you turn around and come back through a different area, obviously. And then, but this coming year for the fiftieth is a uh, a peninsula run, so they'll run all the way down from to to La Paz, you know, down the down to the bottom there. And um, I mean, it's just awesome. I, I really, I, I'm telling you, I would. Hell, I'd probably move to Mexico if I could, to, but I don't only want to live on the Baja coast. I don't want to live in the regular part of Mexico, <laughs> but Baja, Mexico, I would live there in a heartbeat. And uh, and it's just and I'd only and if I could, I'd race, you know, only off road. I mean, I get to hang out. The, the coolest thing about being part of the BFG family is, you know, on the performance team, I'm teammates with like the greatest off road racers in the world. Like, you know, Rob McCachran just won his third. A Baja 1000 in a row overall. He won the he won the, uh, the Lucas Oil Off Road Series Pro Four class last year. Like I think that's his second one of those in a row. He just won the San Felipe 250, and he is the Michael Schumacher of off road racing. And we were just in Utah for the the team summit, and we're hanging out with him. He's like the most competitive guy you will ever meet in your life, and. Uh, and we're we're having team autocrosses, and so he split us in half. And so, like, you know, we had a plan. He, he he grabs me and Kyle Tucker, and we're all we're all three of us. Are, so here's the deal. Here's what we're gonna do. And our autocrosses start when your first teammate took off from the start line. We all would drive these cars, and the last person to finish is when the the, the timing stopped. And so. We, as, as someone would come in, we had multiple cars. So, like, you know, me and McCacker are bolting, are, are belting people in. And, like, there's this moment, Cash, when you look over, you know, I look over and I'm like, look at Rob McCacker. And I was, we're belting this guy in to go out and do this little competition. And I'm like, this is surreal. Like, this is the greatest freaking off road racer ever. And, He's my teammate, and we're hanging out, we're doing this, we're kicking that other team's ass, right? So this is this awesome feeling, and we're having a great old time, and um, that stuff is cool. And, you know, we got Bryce Menzies, who's also, he just set the world record last year for the world's longest jump in a vehicle. He jumped like two football fields long in a trophy truck for Red Bull, and then... And they, and then they were going to do it live, but in one, and he did it in the practice jump. He 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 set the record, and then um, 
and then the last practice jump before the thing, a cuss the wind caught the truck and flipped it over, and he broke his shoulder and all the stuff. Oh. So, he, so he couldn't get to do it live, you know, on live Red Bull TV. But you know, but he, this kid is like, he's probably 28 years old now. He's like the most rounded, best representative I've ever seen out of Red Bull. And uh, a good person, you know, the first year I met him, I watched him do the first 568 miles of Baja, gets out with a 15-minute lead in the trophy truck class, looks at his his teammates, he says, I'll be right back, and for 20 minutes signed autographs and took pictures with every single person at that pit that wanted one, and then went back to the team and and, and then debriefed about what had happened. Now, that seems maybe, you know, okay, that's cool. Well, if you had to just get in your car and drive 500 miles in today's traffic, when you got there and somebody said, hey, look, you're going to go sign autograph. He, and he did this on his own, by the way. Nobody made him do it. But nobody would want to do that. But this guy just ran the 568 miles of Baja leading in the roughest conditions you could ever imagine. And and he wanted to, you know, do this for these kids and these people. It was awesome. And uh, and then we got Casey Curry, who's another guy, just a fabulous driver and the king of social media, and uh, just just awesome experience. And we got Cameron Steele now on our team. I don't know if you know who Cameron is, but he like does he's the announcer for X Games, and he just won actually he just won the Nora one thousand this past weekend for BFG. So it's like really cool, you know. And and the whole thing in Utah was cool because we got to uh, we were doing that Ford Racing School, and I've got. I got Cameron and Casey in my class, and we're out there running five liter Mustangs on the road course, and uh, we're not allowed to pass. So, so I run these guys down, and thinks I know they're the greatest in their field, you know. So, but I, they're they're kind of, you know, they're not as fast as the asphalt guys are. So, so I'm looking in the mirror, and in Casey's rearview mirror, in one session, and he's looking at me, he's giddy like a school kid. And he, when we get back in the pits, he's like, man. That was awesome. I so much wanted you to just pass me, but I knew they'd yell us. I was going to wave you by because I just wanted to learn how to go faster. Yep. And it was like, it was cool because he, he you know, he case you a little younger than us, but it was all about like, he just, he's like us. He loves what he does and he wants to be the best. And that kind of stuff was really cool. And, and, uh, and Cameron, when we came back the next session, I did that to Cameron. Cameron got out of the car. He's like, I'm sorry, I was holding you up. And like, no, you know, I'm just messing with you guys. You know, I'm just having a good time. And uh, so that kind of stuff is, is, is what it's all about. It's just about having fun. And then we had a single autocross, and, and, uh, and I was able to, you know, beat all like, everybody on the team, you know, in the autocross stuff, and, which is a whole lot of fun. I mean, hell, I got as a teammate Terry Earwood. I don't know if you know who Terry Earwood is, but he's a lead instructor for Skip Barber for 33 years now. He is the winningest driver ever in the Firestone Firehawk series. He's in two drag racing Hall of Fames. The dude is forgot more about racing than most people will ever know. He has teammates with Doc Bundy and uh, Dorsey Schrader in different series throughout the years. Uh, he was actually roommates with uh, with Doc Bundy. He's coming to teach for me this coming weekend at the Shelby Fest out in Jefferson City. So um, somehow, can I've been able to take autocrossing and, and turn it into to my job and get to meet some of the coolest, nicest people in the world and, and play in playgrounds all over the world. Somehow autocross, I've been to South Africa once to, to, for some work-related stuff through through Evolution. So I just feel lucky and blessed that I've been able to do it. And, and uh, you know, they, anybody who thinks autocrossers don't get it, I kind of laugh, and I just realize they really just don't get it. Because it's fun, and it teaches you skill sets that, that are everything you could ever need to be a great driver on the street or to be a great racer in any aspect. Yeah, that, that's great to hear from you, especially since you're around all these people. And also, I want to note to everybody, you've turned a passion into what you call your job, but it's fun. So it's not really a job that you're like, oh, my goodness, I have to go out Yeah, and well, for every day there's some, you know, for every day you're out there driving a GT3 or something like that, there's plenty of days in the office and you're pulling your hair out. So <laughs> it is still a job on some days. And, and there's days when I have to remind myself that, you know, that, you know, you get pissed because you, you're all this office work or something's coming up and it's stressful. You know, it's just like every other job. But but in the end, you know, there's plenty of days out there that, that it, it's 
so much worth it. So. Hey, tell us the difference. So Evo School, tell us the different parts of your, let's say, company or job. Well, I mean, mainly we do autocross stuff, but uh, we also do a lot of training with U.S. military, special forces, usually. Uh, we do, we, we've done off-road as well as on-road, Mo- mainly do on-road stuff, or we'll, we'll take, uh, we'll call them loaner cars, and we'll teach them one day in those, and then on the next day we usually use up-armored Humvees or up-armored SUVs, and, uh, you know, t- think police EVOP training, but at a, a little bit higher level. Uh, we do a lot of teaching them how to drive in reverse in case they're ambushed in an alley or something like that. And then, um, you know, then we'll kind of graduate through the weights of cars. You'll start with, like, a sedan, and then you work up to a pickup truck, and then you'll take them into these uh, fully up-armored SUVs, I mean, uh, or even the, the fully up-armored Humvees. So you're talking a 14,000-pound vehicle. Um, and then, you know, on occasion we'll do off-road training with those guys as well. And, uh be quite honest with you, it's my favorite thing to do as far as you know, driver training goes because um, a lot of these guys just don't have that ability to drive like uh, like we do, that's for sure. But they're going to be put in a high-stress, uh, very volatile environment, and usually the day they need my training is a day that their life is in danger. Uh, and... So we want them to be able to get the hell out of there as fast as possible in the, in the safest way possible. But still, they have to be smooth enough uh, to be able to have a functioning gunner. You know what I mean? So a guy in a turret. So this guy's got to drive, you know, at 10 tenths out of a hostile environment with a guy in a turret shooting at the bad guy. They've got to be smooth. They've got to be efficient. They have to have a game plan. They have to be mentally ready for that and verbally ready, be able to explain to the folks in the car where they're going and when they're going there so that everybody's ready. Because it could be nothing worse than being, you know, the guy in the turret getting ready to shoot and then some guy takes a right-hand turn he's not expecting. So we teach them how to do that. And um, so that, that's kind of neat. We've also done a transportation group. And you really haven't lived until you took a tanker truck to a 60-foot swallow, honestly. <laughs> So that that's that's a lot of fun as well, and uh, and we do some team programs. Although uh, I hate to say it, but the team program, while I think is another one of those programs that's probably one of the the better programs we do, um, it's really hard to to, to fill. Uh, there's a lot of there's a variation of reasons why that is, but a lot of times, but I hate to say it, is parents will go out and spend twenty thousand dollars to buy their kid a car, but won't spend. Two hundred dollars. How to teach them how to drive it, and, and as you and I know, when we were younger, we did stupid things we shouldn't have, and or even worse, like an animal runs out or a child runs out in front of you, you got to make some kind of an evasive mo- maneuver. They don't know how to do it, or they overcorrect from driving off the edge of the road, and now they, you know, hit something head on or drive off the other side of the road into a tree or something, and now, you know, you've got a whole other level of problems. So. I found it's so hard to get these things to fill up. And, and part of that might be because you've got programs that are free out there. Um, but one of the things that's you know, a little bit different, I think, in ours is you know, we, we really push them to drive the cars. You know, we, don't, we don't put timers on them, obviously, but we really push them to get the cars out of shape so they know what to do. Um, we'll use, we'll use a, a loaner car, we'll call it again, in one of, in a two wheel off exercise. I would use it in their own, it, to me, the key with kids is they need to be doing schools in their car. You know, it's really nice that there's a bunch of programs out there that provide cars for these kids to learn in, but you have that kid that's got that 89 Honda Civic, it doesn't have ABS, and you've taught him how to drive in a brand new, you know, BMW, Kia, Audi, or whatever that has ABS and has all this, these goodies that help save them sometimes. Um, and then he gets home and he gets his 89 Civic and then he locks up the brake and slams into something. Now, you know, that's an issue. So I like them to do the programs in their own car. And uh, But we do the two-wheel off exercise in a car that we provide uh, because I don't want to damage their vehicles. And uh, I think that is a huge, huge uh, piece of an important teen driving school program is a two-wheel-off exercise because uh, that's a lot of kids 
make mistakes like that. And distracted driving is probably the biggest thing. And obviously, people texting and driving is a problem. So we'll put an element in there where we distract them. Obviously, we don't use cell phones because that would be wrong. But you know, we'll, we'll get them to you know maybe dial in a radio station while they're in the middle of a slalom, you know, <laughs> and 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 see, hey, turn it to eighty-seven point nine on the FM dial, and they're like, you know, what? And, and and see how efficient they can do that. And then they realize they can't, and they hit cones. And then, wow, you know, that could have been a kid while you were texting. You know, make them think. Um, I mean, we talked about it earlier about, you know, thinking ahead, making a game plan. Life is, you need to be well thought out in life. And and that's where the kids driving today, they're not well thought out. They don't think that sending that text could be the last text they'll ever send. They don't think about that. So... That's I, part I of what we do in that, I, that program. I didn't think that there was a stoplight ahead with a flatbed truck in front of me when I looked at the girls on the left. And my little 85 <laughs> Honda Accord quickly smacked in the back of that at probably 10 miles an hour or 15 and crunch. I can't even imagine being yep. a kid and having the extra distractions now. And with me, it was enough that there were three or four of us in a car, guys, looking around like, look over there. Okay, smash. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. X, yeah, so that's a little bit about what we do. So autocross training, military training, and, uh, oh, and where, then where, the team stuff. And where, then for me, I, I, I do some other stuff as well. Where could somebody contact you with questions? Is it evoschool.com? Is that the best way to, to get messages if they want to try to get a teen school or learn from you or sign up for anything? What's the best place? Yeah, that would that, that would be the best. You can hit the uh, – there's a contact us uh, link there at evoschool.com. And uh, that'll come to me, and you can hook up with things there. It's pretty easy to do schools, and from a hosting standpoint, when it's when it's club or autocross related stuff, basically I just you you know the clubs will procure a site, and I just write a check at the end of the event for every all their costs, and then you know, I take care of registration and and everything. And you know, back in the day, well, things were done a little differently, but now it, it's pretty simple. Uh, you know, I, I can insure the events. A lot of the clubs get better pricing on insurance, so uh, you know I can do it uh, either way. Though, if the club doesn't want to insure it, I can do that. And uh, you know, like I said, at the end of the event, I just write them a check, and I usually give them some kind of donation if they, you know, for using their cones and their timing equipment. But from a team standpoint, you know, those are a little different, but we can do those as well. We just have to come up with a good site, and you know, cones, timing, and all that stuff myself. And uh, so pretty simple stuff. Just give me a call if you got anything out there you want to do, and we'll, we'll get something going. Yo, nice. Whatever group you want. I, I, like, I like knowing that people are doing more stuff with the kids. I mean, personally, my younger brother actually was a stepbrother. He died in a car wreck. And it might have been when you were saying the two-wheel off thing, I'm like, no kidding, it was wet, and somehow the car ended up backwards and into a ditch. So that, that hits home whenever people talk about that. It's like, no kidding, how can we – help teach more kids and i really do think autocross in general i mean i even think when i wasn't a teenager anymore how i would still drive on the streets but once i started autocrossing all that went out the window like i don't do anything crazy in the streets anymore i don't think as you say that's exactly how you know before i ever autocrossed i was um, i was a menace to myself much less the rest of society in a car i just didn't get it and then i Went to my first autocross, and I was like, so let me get this straight. I can drive however I want from start to finish, and I'm not going to get in trouble? And they're like, no, we want you to get there as fast as you can. I'm like, no problem, dude. I'm in. <laughs> and then I I really I didn't get any more tickets, you know, for, well, shoot, until maybe 10 years ago. It was my first ticket I had in, in 20 years, and that was, you know, that was just a, a fluke, actually. So, um, you know, it just gives you a place that you can do something and have some fun and, and keep the streets safe like they should be, you know. And that's why it always burns me up when I see all this crazy stuff with these cars and coffee events. I'm like, how do you – it's a it's a car show, you know. Like, really? Like, how does this happen? I don't get that. But um, – I don't know. People do stupid stuff. You can't. You can't fix stupid. So, yeah. <laughs> do you have a favorite car you'd pick out of all the cars you've driven? Even yeah, any, anything you've raced in, I guess. Um, I, I like I said, you can't go wrong with Corvettes, man. I I, I am just a, a Corvette junkie. Um, I really can't believe how badass a car I built myself. I never built a car before, and. uh 
you know, I'd always buy a car and pull parts off and put new parts on and felt like I, you know, I had this something special, but with the 71 Stingray I built, you know, I, I, you know, I had some help here and there on different things, but for the most part, man, I built a, a completely ridiculously fast car. Actually, I built too much car for faster than my Z06, if that tells you anything. And, uh, and I did it all myself, really. So, uh, that might be my favorite car. I'm not saying I wouldn't sell it, but, uh, I, I definitely, it's amazingly fast. Um, you know, I, I think GT3s are, are a lot, any Porsche, they're, they're pretty fun. I, they're not my thing really. Um, like I sit and I, I feel bad for Andy Hollis. I don't know why he puts himself through owning that McLaren that he has because it breaks all the time. Like I, I, if I had a car that I had that much money in and it broke that much, I would have probably already driven it through the showroom by now of the dealership because I, you know, I, and there's a little bit of me that understands because if he loves it that much, you know, I get it. But at the same time, it's like, is any car worth that big a headache? Um, but you know, so there's cool cars out there, but you know, I, I've driven a lot of cool stuff. I want to drive a trophy truck, drive one. I've ridden in one. Um, I love to drive a trophy truck. I call them the big comfy couch because they look like when you're going over those crazy whoop-de-doos, like, you know, you're sitting on a couch, but the rest of the car's working so hard. I think that would be a, a lot of fun. Um, if you could have, if you could drive anybody's autocross car, let's say that you haven't driven, what comes to mind? What class, what car? I don't know. I'd probably drive Kiesel's car. I'd like to try that. It could be fun. Jeff and Jeff's a nice guy. Jeff, Jeff is uh, just got a really good piece, that's for sure, for that car. And he's a nice guy, and and uh, it's kind of neat because he's the same thing. You know, he built it himself, so I'm, I'm uh, kind of envious that he built something so cool. But you know, but at the same time, that's his gig, and he likes it. And and uh, my gig was I could have probably done the same thing, but I'd top off it for an old Corvette. So, but that was a little bit of that was because I started running good guys events and uh, and wanted to be able to go out there and have something to play with those that group in because um, I went to enough good guys events to see that you know it's a great opportunity to help more people be faster autocrossers, and so that's why I wanted to have something to go play with with them. But uh, you know, as far as other cars I could drive. I'd say Kiesel's car would be right up there at the top. Um, and honestly, the rest of them, I've, I've driven so many of the, shoot, I mean, I, of the top tier cars, I think it'd be fun. Maybe, maybe, uh, may, I probably would like to drive Hyman's car some more time, Eric Hyman's car, because I'd like to see what that's all about. I don't, I don't understand the GTR love that much. So maybe if I drove it, I would, um, <laughs> To me, it looked like two tons of fun, and I don't see what's fun about something so heavy. But although his is probably lighter than 98% of them out there, I'm sure, um, that would be a cool car to drive. But other than that, I mean, honestly, it doesn't. I don't care. If it's got wheels, I'll drive it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I heard you might have driven some wheels off of some of the rental cars. Yeah, yeah, we've... Uh, We've driven some wheels off. Hell, I drove a wheel right off of a Baja buggy, a BC buggy. So. <laughs> and, and had a few hours to think about it. Oh, yeah. How fast do you get yeah. going in that? Like you said, what I liked hearing was you you should drive it like 60 or 70% because you got to finish, which I imagine if you go at first, you're not on a competitive team. Yeah. You want to finish. So you made it sound less scary yeah. to me that you're not. I mean, I guess you can only drive as far as you can see and have a kind of clue of what you're well, coming up to. Yeah, you got to drive what you can see. That's it. but I mean, like if you're going across a dry leg bed, you you know you're going to just have it welded to the floor, you know. And and so the BC buggy runs with a Subaru drivetrain uh, with a Weddle transmission. It'll go 100 miles an hour, um, but they have 20 20 inches of travel. So the coolest thing I ever did the first year I went there on pre-run, this guy, a teammate, Rich Mingo, was riding with me. He's been doing it for 25 years or more, maybe maybe, maybe 35 years. And uh, he's a stunt man, and uh, not not a lot of fear in Mingo when it comes to a vehicle. And uh, there's this, we're all in a line in pre-run, spaced out, so we're not driving each other's dust. But it's a long gravel road, so we can see everybody. And there's 10 or 12 of us in line, and we're just riding around in eight, kind of looking at you know what what we're racing on and we're cruising like 60 65 maybe 70 at the tops 
And uh, I look down way ahead, and I see this huge, like, jump. I mean, when I say jump, I'm talking like, you know, a big, you know, rock pile or whatever the hell it was. And it was big and off to the side, just like gas stations. It's like they had built this thing right in front of this gas station so people could watch you jump it. And so the guys that are in front of me, some of them would jump and land on top and jump kind of down it. And then some of them rolled it. Some of them went around it. And as we're heading down, I look at Minga and I'm like, and, you know, I'm new at this. I don't know what these vehicles are really capable of. And I'm like, Minga, yeah? Can I hit this that fast? And, you know, we're, like I said, we're going 60, 65 miles an hour. <laughs> and he's like, go for it, brother. <laughs> right on. I mean, like, you don't have to tell me twice. So I hit this thing, and it was Dukes of Hazards. I mean, and when you, by the way, the engine's in the back, right? So when you hit that, it's the feeling of the motor coming up over, you know, like all of a sudden the tail of the car goes above the front of the car slightly. And we're flying through the air kind of on tilt. And we clear the bottom of the jump, you know, the landing portion, and just land, and it's just like, poof, and just keeps on going like nothing happened. And I was like, are you kidding me? It's like, you can do that? He's like, yeah, man, these things are really capable. And... And so from that point forward, like, I didn't do anything like that again. But, you know, I knew that you could go over things that you would, could never do in a normal vehicle. You know, it was like, it was awesome. Um, but, you know, you, again, you got to make it last to the end of the race. So it's not like you would do that in a race. That was a pre-run kind of deal. And But there's not nothing to say that you're driving along in Baja and then somebody put a booby trap out there. And by the way, you know, people talk about Baja and booby traps. People think that they're trying to hurt you. They're not necessarily trying to hurt you at all. And what they want to do is they want you to do something spectacular or they want you to get stuck so that then you give them money to help get out, you know? And so I think that, I think that a lot of people mistake that when they say that, Oh, I wouldn't go run Baja because they booby trapped the course. It's, they're not trying to hurt you. It's, it's, so, I hope people kind of know that they're, they're more just want to help you get out of a bad situation so that they can, you know, get 20 bucks for help push you out. Um, you know, it's, it's weird. Baja this year on the pre-run, we, we saw this guy that built this big chump right in the middle of the trail. And if, and if we didn't have our guide with us to tell us, Hey dude, you're going to come up at mile at this mile marker and there's going to be this jump there. There's some guys over in the bushes, you know, they just want to see you do something cool. Don't, you know, just be aware, you know, and they were, they were literally got three guys sitting off to the side watching that jump because they wanted to see us just, you know, watch in the air and do something crazy. So, you know, it's, it, I think they get a little bit of a bad rap, but they're badass, man. It's, it's the most fun thing I've, I've ever done. Um, if I knew how I could afford to, to do it, I'd race every single one of those races I could. And I'm not even opposed to selling everything I have and moving to Mexico for it. That's, <laughs> that's how awesome it is. So you've won the driver of eminence award. You've been the pro solo overall yes. champion. What stands out as the highlight or two from autocross, either events, runs, things, winning, Finishing fourth in super stock and the Elise with a two second penalty in a 60 car field. That is awesome. I, uh, that was the first year I ran the Elise, or the only year I ran the Elise. And, uh, the first day I clipped a cone, it, it rained, and I clipped a cone on my fastest run in the slalom. And, uh, and was, I was finished, ended up finishing fourth for the event, but that was my fastest run with a two second penalty. So, uh, at the end of that, Eric Strelnick won, and he came up to me. And he was like, "I get the jacket, but you won the race." You know, he's, which was a pretty awesome thing to hear from Eric. He's like, "If I wouldn't have hit the cone, I'd have won by nine tenths, I think." Wow! Uh, in, in super, in super, when you know what would be SSR now, but super stock then. Um, and and you know, I like to do things that other people don't like. So that year, they. When they got to nationals, they put a set of Penske's on the, the Elise we were running because they're they're the best. And I took a couple of runs on the practice course, and I told the guys like, if you kind of keep those shocks on the car, I'm not going to drive the car. He's like, excuse me. I was like, those things are horrible. And it was not that they were horrible. It's like I had no time in them, and no time to get them settled like I wanted them. The car didn't feel right to me, 
And I was like, you can put, you know, you put the stock chocks back on the car or I'm going to drive the Corvette I just brought. Because if I just bought a Corvette and, and it was there. So I could have driven an SAST uh, in my Corvette, and which that's what I told him I would do if he didn't change them. And so he did. And then we went out and we really would have won if it wasn't for me being dumb and hit the cone. So um, that is probably probably one of my highlights as far as autocross stuff goes. I mean, driving the driver of eminence thing was cool. I don't, I don't think I really deserved it at that point in my career, really. I mean, I hadn't, I think that, um, I think Jinx Jordan should have gotten it well before he did. You know, he just got it last year. He should have gotten it years ago. Um, you know, that's just my opinion. I, I have a lot of love and admiration for Jinx and, and, uh, you know, he's been around the sport a long time, and he surely deserved that before I got it. Um, you know, I, I won the Johnson Spirit of the Sport Award. I thought that we were before all that even, and uh, that was kind of cool because it, was, it, it really kind of, honestly, that's me. It's just like I just want to have a good time. I don't, you know, I just don't like to take things this so serious. I mean, like I said, it's just plastic cones in a parking lot. So um, that was kind of fun, and. Uh, and I love it, you know, I'm lucky and I'm a little different than everyone else in that, you know, Evolution is responsible for, for probably 55% of all of the national champions and national trophy winners in the sport, meaning they've at least come through the program. So so every time somebody goes up on that stage and I look at them and I know they've been through the school, and I, that, that's a lot of satisfaction for me. It's like, um, I'll be honest, like, Brian Peters, he he's a you know kind of a, a you know product of the school. He, the, the guy is an amazing driver. He's a great guy. He's a great instructor. And I you know look at what he's done lately, and I'm, I'm really proud of that guy. Uh, and a great person. So for me, winning isn't always being the guy that that, that gets the big trophy. It, it's just about you know living something that I love and helping others get that same feeling. That's pretty awesome. You know, so um, it's not necessarily about Mike winning anything. I like, don't get me wrong. I like to win. I'm not going to tell you that. I was uh, finished second at uh, two years ago at the good guys finale in Scottsdale in that car that I built, which it still had primer on it. And I lost to Danny Pop by like, I don't remember what it was, like point point one. Three nine or something, you know, something with less than a tenth and a half. Um, that's pretty awesome. And you know, Danny's had that car in his family for, you know, since like you know the seventies, early seventies. I think they were second owners of the car, but I want to say they had it since seventy three, and it's a seventy two. So, and he's got a lot of seat time in that car. To finish second to Danny in a in my car that I built, and but you know he helped me a lot with with the setup for sure. But still, the hell of a feeling, you know. Kind of on, in a way heartbroken. I didn't get to run the finale uh, this past year at the Good Guys, but it runs on the same weekend as the Baja 1000. And I will tell you, it, it, I don't care if, what it takes. If, if I get an opportunity to race in the thousand, I'm all over it. And I don't. I'd miss solo nationals over that. Um, so um, I don't know. This year it's the 50th running. I'm praying that that, that uh, Jeff Cummings has a spot for me on the team from BFG, but. Um, you know, if, if he does, that'd be awesome. If not, then maybe I'll be in Scottsdale to, to, to try to see if I can take Danny down. We'll see. We'll see. That That's one heck of a sell for Baja 1000. That, that must be one <laughs> heck of an event. Now, I, I thank you for all the information and time and all the all the teaching you gave us here. Oh, yeah, no problem, man. It's just, it's just part of it. Thanks for listening. For the show notes and contact information, please visit autocrosstalk.com. There you can also subscribe so that we can keep you up to date on new shows as they come out. Also, please leave us a review on iTunes and subscribe on iTunes for the upcoming shows. You can connect to our Facebook page at facebook.com slash autocrosstalk. You can share your thoughts, your insights, your questions, your suggestions there. Also, share with your friends. Hopefully you found it entertaining and motivating, and hopefully other people will as well. It's been fun, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for listening, and check back next week for the next show.